recorded live. Hello, this is Michael Adams, and it's nothing but the truth, one man's journey to find it. And it is January the 7th, 2016, and uh, we have uh, a very unique show for us tonight. Uh, We're going to have a debate of sorts between uh, two gentlemen that I have uh, a, a lot of respect for. Uh, Mark Sargent, and most of you will know him from uh, his uh, Flat Earth Clues videos and his um, show, Strange World, and um, that you can uh, find on Truth Frequency Radio. And uh, so, yeah, that's going to be really awesome. Mark has been on the show before. Chris has been on the show, uh, I believe, a couple times now. And Christopher Tyreman as well. Uh, Christopher Tyreman has a website called chronicleproject.org and has written uh, or co authored, I believe, a book uh, with uh, Paul. Brad, uh, Brad Hornholt. There you go. Okay, they, Brad Hornholt. Hornholt. He's listening actually tonight, so he's out there. Hi, Brad. <laughs> and the name of the book is Destruction of the Sabbath. And uh, what I find interesting about two of these gentlemen is uh, the fact that they're willing to upset the apple cart and they're willing to question a lot of the beliefs that are out there that are very cherished beliefs. And so what we have going on here tonight, folks, is we're going to have uh, a debate about the flat earth. And, of course, we know that uh, Mark Sargent will be the one uh, uh, debating for the fact that we live in a, on a flat Earth that is a geocentric model. And on uh, the opposite spectrum, that would be Chris, Chris Tyreman. It would be his position that we uh, live in a heliocentric model, uh, a solar system and a universe in which we revolve around the sun, etc. So I'm finding this to be... Uh, uh, I believe this will be a rewarding time for uh, all who will listen to this. Uh, reason is because I, I know a little bit about these men and their, at least their work. I, I, I respect their integrity, their tenacity, their willingness to challenge the, the cherished norms that are out there. And actually, actually, both these gentlemen have caused me to rethink a lot of my positions and this world and in my life, so I'm really looking forward to it. So, with that, John, before we actually get started, I want to say thank you to both of you. Um, and I would, uh, I think we should start out first, if it's all right, if it's not, doesn't make you too uncomfortable, Mark, is an update on your condition. Because, there's <laughs> a lot, no, seriously, there's a lot of people that really care about you, and, uh, you know, when I I found out that you were well. You went in the hospital for a New Year's present. Yeah, uh, that was quite, quite disturbing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Ending ending the 2015 year with uh, an appendix being taken out. Not quite what I was I had in mind, but uh, it's now been a full week since I was released. So I was released on December 31st, and here we are. You know, coming around just about for another week, and I'm about I don't know 90 percent. I'd say pretty pretty good. So everything, you know, all the all the drugs have pretty much been through my system, and no complications, no infections that I know of, and uh, went very surgery went very well. So again, thank you to everybody out at Providence Hospital in Everett, Washington, which is north of Seattle, uh, because it went uh, very smoothly. So. <laughs> and uh, Zan Garcia, by the way, text uh, in the. Uh, uh, in the chat room to Chris, Orphan Red is a Canadian who knows truth, unlike Chris. Ha ha ha. Tell him I'm not sending him his birthday present now. <laughs> Zen Garcia is a friend of ours, and a, uh, <laughs> as far as me and Marco, the fellow flat earther. So I want to try to keep my opinion and comments to a very minimum, gentlemen. I want this to be your evening. I ask folks, oh, first of all, folks, for anybody who, this is the structure. What, I, what I've, I've asked is that. Uh, Chris will open this to discussion slash debate with uh, comments, his opening comments, and I ask them not to leak go any further than 10 minutes with your opening comments, but then I want to have them uh, open discussion between each other, and then some final comments after that, and then after all that is done, uh, if there's anyone in the chat room who 
desires to ask a question, you can either call in or you could type it in in the chat room, and I can and we'll have a, a Q and A session. So um, I think this is going to be a, a rewarding, enriching, and a useful time um, as we dis- discover uh, the truth about our reality, what a really a world is or may be, and uh, how much more we actually need to learn. So. With that, Chris, I think the best way to go is just get you going with this and have you state your position and why you feel that we um, live in a heliocentric solar system slash universe, etc. Yeah, and I and I have to try to actually make it sound like I'm serious about this, don't I? Yes. Yes, my position I'm sitting, but moving <laughs> past and beyond that. Um, it's funny, actually, because I hadn't sat down at any of the time here because what I did is prepare a bunch of questions because I was I was curious uh, about the material. But the reason my position at the moment is uh, that everything, in my personal opinion, is seems in our world and what we observe outside the world is based upon spheres and the movement of spheres. And as far as physics works, uh, the sphere model is the easiest, least complex form of putting this all together because uh, it works on the same dynamic. And if you're using it once, why not use it for everything? And so when I go outside and I see things, so far when I've read about the flat earth model, it could not explain uh, a lot of the material that I myself personally could observe. And because of that, I have to sit on the not flat level right now and say that I'm curving towards everything being spheres. That didn't last 10 minutes, did it? <laughs> no, it didn't, but I think you... Well, thank you. No, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a good starting point, sure. Yeah. And, of course, for those, you know, most of us would know uh, Mark's position, but for somebody who may listen to this in the future or even now, Mark, where's your position on things? My position is that I started out, like just about everybody listening, uh, as a globalist and believed it because, well, I saw a globe in my first-grade classroom, and I saw the, the, the picture from NASA, and, you know, for the 90-something percent of my life, that is what I believed. Like everybody else, that is, you know, I was a globalist. I love the globe model. I think it's very cool. <clears throat> and then when I ran into uh, a few people back in the middle of 2014 who said otherwise, who said, no, there's something wrong here. There's something that doesn't add up. I thought, all right, I'll just shoot this sucker down. It should not be that hard, and I'll I'll give you a kind of a different take on it, which I normally would do, Um, which is I said, okay, in order to shoot it down, I should be able to go to, uh, let's take a metaphorical room with, uh, you know, a door on it called scientific evidence, and I thought this room would be, and you open the door, and it's filled floor to ceiling with boxes and crates, and you're thinking, oh, well, I just open up a box or two and should be able to knock this thing out. And, you know, there's tons of evidence here to sort through. No need to be greedy. And the more boxes and crates I went through, the more I was feeling ripped off because I was opening them and they should have been jam-packed full of stuff. And there was like just tiny bits and like, like a few pieces of packing popcorn here and there, but there was nothing in the boxes. Uh, and the more I looked, the worse it got to the point where I started, I had to flip, uh, you know, in the the beginning of 2015, where I had to say, okay, how do I know it's a globe? How how could I prove this to somebody? And I couldn't do it. There's too many, and we'll get into it. Uh, But the big question is, you know, you want the the T-shirt for 2016 for Flat Earth, the question is where? Where is all the evidence, the mountains, mountains of evidence that should be there from the scientific standpoint? And it's just not there. Everything that we were told was there, it's just not. And so that's when I made Flat Earth Clues and and put it out there. And that's basically the question I I put to the Internet back in February of of 2015. Tell me how you know it's a globe. Don't don't, don't tell me something. Just don't, don't quote a textbook. Tell me how you know. And if you had unlimited money and unlimited time, could you grab the average person on the street and convince him he was on the, he was on the globe. And, uh, and here we are, you know, beginning of 2016. Not only has nobody answered the question, but it, it's, it's turned the absolute, absolute opposite direction, which is uh, people have started coming forward from uh, the military sector, 
uh, from the private sector, uh, all that have access to instruments that the average person doesn't have, and they're all corroborating the same thing. They're all saying the same thing. And that is, I'll break it down to three things, and then I'll dial the end of my little rant, which is one, uh, for anyone that's, that's new to this, there's three points here. One, there apparently appears to be no curvature to where we are at all. And if we're on a globe, there should be a curvature somewhere. And no one can prove, no one can show any evidence of this outside of some, some pictures from NASA. Nobody on the ground can, can show anything. Two, the Earth apparently is not spinning at all, uh, which means there's no Coriolis effect, uh, which, which affects both uh, ballistics um, uh, and star trails. And the three, the, the maps that we have all been taught, most notably the Mercator map that we've been using for 500 years, is wrong. It, 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 everything is wrong. In fact, the maps get worse and more uh, the, the, the incorrectness of them get more and more exaggerated as you get past the equator. On a globe, it's considered uh, you know, the, the equator, but on a flat map, it's considered the outer ring. So between those three things, there, there's no way. I couldn't, even if I wanted to, I cannot go back and, and prove that it's a, uh, a globe now, even if, even if I wanted to, and, and neither can science. And uh, the fact that Neil deGrasse Tyson it will not, he's just running from it, not walking, but running from interviews. He will not be in the same room with me. Uh, you know, it's, it's just one little testament to that. So anyway, that's my little opener. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Um, okay, for folks in the chat room, if you want, at the end of this discussion slash debate, between Mark and Chris, and if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to type them in. Please type them in after they're done with their discussion, and for continuity purposes and uh, the high probability that maybe one of your questions will be answered during their discussion. And then you can also call in for the Q&A time, which will be after they're done with their, their conversation. So now, with that, um, I would like to open this up a little bit between the two of you, so because it, it, this is a, a it's a very strange topic, really, at the end of the day, but yet a very I feel a very important topic, and I understand why um, this is going to be a very challenging thing to actually have a debate because of the many many questions that people have um, when it comes to whether the Earth is flat or not, and um, I think that <laughs> Mark, I think you realize. If you haven't figured this out, you will, I'm sure. As time goes on, there's going to be more questions than uh, debate. If you, you know what I mean? Oh, no, no, that's fine. Again, you know, lots, even, even Stanton, you know, he was like, he, he's going to do the same thing that Christopher is going to do. And that is, it's like, wait, well, so how does this work exactly? And I had to, I had to build it out for Stanton, and, uh, which is fine. I, I have to build it out every freaking day uh, when I get emails. I know. So it's totally cool. <laughs> You're changing people's paradigms. It's kind of like the same way if you look at, uh, I'm going to deviate a little bit here, folks, but if you look at uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Tyerman's work with uh, his new approach to the uh, Hebrew language and the ancient Hebrew language and how that's really changing our understanding of uh, the Old Testament and uh, other things. So uh, this then, we're, these two men are changing our paradigms of how we see the world. And so, it's always going to be this way, whether what side we're on and so on. So, far. so with that, I think what we'll do, the most logical thing to do, is start with Chris. To, why don't you ask some questions, and we'll go from there. To okay. Mark. Sounds peachy. Um, I, wa I wanted to be able to set up a picture, especially for the listeners, because uh, somebody could be a flat earther, but I've read some of the stuff online, and there's a variant... Um, sizes, dimensions, and everything. So I figured before we started, it would probably be smart if I actually got the dimensions that you've been talking about, because I, I haven't had time to go to do the shows. Um, and, and then from there, the questions I ask would probably make more sense. So I guess my first question is, what's the width of... Now, if we're not going to call it a planet, what are we going to... What's the width of the pancake? Um, yeah, the pancake, the plane, the enclosed world, the enclosed dirt. I like, I like the word plane. Okay. Okay. Plane. And, and for those who still don't understand the word plane, let's just think of it like a dinner plate. Yeah. Uh, the, the plane dimensions. And again, the, um, part of the reason why uh, there isn't, you know, there's so many enthusiastic but uh, um, 
but heated debates within the Flat Earth community itself is because we're still trying to work out uh, the exact scale of the map. But if you want to look kind of a rough picture of what it would look like for anyone that's yeah. new, the rough exactly. picture, it's, it's so from a shape standpoint, okay. it's round, right? It's, it's flat. But yeah. the, so the, and the North Pole would be in the center. Yeah. The, the continents would be spread out organically. If you want kind of a ballpark of what the continents would look, at, look like, you can, there's two places you could look. Uh, the easy place, is, of course, is just look up the uh, United Nations flag uh, on any search engine. You type in the United Nations flag. And the United Nations flag, the layout is identical to two other maps, uh, although not as detailed. Uh, the, other, the, the main projection is called the Azimuthal, A-Z-I-M-U-T-H-A-L, Equidistance project, Projection. That's on Wiki. You can go look it up. Uh, it's a thousand-year-old uh, top-down perspective where the North Pole is in the center. The continents are spread out kind of organically, like the UN flag. And then Antarctica, instead of being a continent that's sort of at the bottom, that's shaped a little bit bigger than Australia, is actually stretched out around the entire outer edge of this thing. So it becomes, Antarctica really becomes this big ring of ice uh, around the outside, which, interestingly enough, works very, very well in a flat model. Uh, uh, and so that's the, and so as far as, that's, that's how it's laid out. As far as how wide it is, uh, if you take the, the circumference, then pancake it, you know, on a globe, and then pancake it down, it's got to be at least... 20,000 plus miles wide at the widest point. Uh, we're, we don't know exactly for sure, but it's got to be at least that wide. Uh, and, you, and when you look at it, that, that makes sense. And then uh, the other questions I know you're going to ask, you might as well break it down all, already, and that is, you know, what about the sun, moon, and stars? Um, Actually, when it before, comes, before that, because um, yeah. I have that part, uh, I'd like to build it from the ground floor up. So what, sure. is, un, what is under the plane? Ah, excellent point. Uh, we don't know. In fact, okay, I had to. So I, 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 I mean, X. Well, yeah, X. Well, but is X any different than what science says is X? And then so I mean, I mean it's, it's simply an unknown at the moment. So I can deal with that. We don't know what it is. It could be. It could be round. It could be flat. It could be stalactites. Exactly. There are some people that have said that it's it's part of a bigger planet. You know, but the point is, but the point is, is at least within this model, yes. it is flat. Now, is it perfectly flat? Well, no. There's mountain ranges and this and that. You know, there's little things here. Right. But it's, are, there, are there warps in it? Well, we haven't found them yet, which is weird because when I started this, I thought it was kind of like the, uh, uh, the flat and stationary, stationary earth map that was done by Orlando Ferguson back in the 1800s, where it kind of was shaped like a uh, hubcap, where it was kind of a, like an old hubcap where it was kind of bulging at the, at the North Pole and kind of dipped down and then kind of came back up a little bit at the outer edge, but we still can't find any curvature at this point. So right now, the people that said, no, no, it's got to be perfectly flat, the purists have been right. So I and mean, I don't lose any sleep over it, but that's, that's where it goes. Okay. Chris, uh, Chris uh, before you go any further, sure. I just want to request uh, from your end. Sure. Uh, when Mark is talking, if you could, uh, well, background noise, like the chairs squeaking and then oh, you're, sniff yeah. you're sniffling yeah. and all that, if you could kind of... I'll you mute my mic. Yes, when he's talking. and it's sense of the mic. Yes, sorry about that. Oh, okay, I'll oh, don't Just because it will distract people who are listening to this. Yeah. And all that sorry stuff. about my, my sniffy there. Okay, so go ahead now. <laughs> so, Mark, how, okay. now, what is covered now? We've got that. We've got underneath. We've got the width. What is yeah. over top of all of this? Okay, over the top. And, I, and again, this is probably the biggest point of contention within the movement, and that is I believe over the top of this thing is an enclosure. Uh, as far as the width of it, it could be much, much larger than the actual ground area, meaning if the ground area is 25,000 miles wide, give or take, uh, the enclosure could be as wide as 50,000 or more. Uh, but it is at minimum height. You know, some people said, oh, it caps out at 80,000 feet or something like that. I don't believe that's true. Uh, I believe minimum height, and I'm only going with the high-altitude nuclear testing it was done from 1958 to 1962. A minimum hype, I'm guessing, at least 400 miles, but could go up to several thousand miles. Do I think it's as arced as heavy as like a snow globe where it's got that ridiculous arc? Eh, maybe, maybe, but I would like to think they, they would try to be a little more efficient than that. But the point is, but there is a structure that is covering this thing, and it has sealed us in, uh, no different than a soundstage 
or uh, the Truman Show, which is actually a soundstage, uh, and then everything else that we see is inside it, meaning uh, the stars, the moon, the sun are all inside this structure. No different than a planetarium, if you go to a planetarium. Everything, it's all completely self-contained. I was waiting for Mike to jump in there for a second. Okay, so <laughs> basically, um, you normally do, Mike. It's freaking me out. Um, would this be described then like a snow globe? Similar, very similar to a snow globe. But I would like to think the shape would be more, again, like a, like a planetarium, like, a, uh, like an arched, a fairly heavily arched sports stadium, okay. if you can, if I, you can just, imagine. I'm just sitting here looking at this and thinking to myself, um, what would be really cool is if the Earth was a cube, because then you can have one of these on each side. Oh, sure. I mean, well, let's put it this way. When it gets out to the outer marker, that, because, you know, and again, I don't want to quote too much scripture here because, uh, you know, I'm going to leave that to other people like Rob Skiba. But when they talk about the four corners of the earth, is it possible that, yeah, even though we're in sort of a circular structure, maybe when it gets out to a certain point, it's actually blocked in and, and, it's, a, and it's a square, which is mm-hmm. what uh, uh, Rob Skiba was actually talking about, that we're actually a dome that's sitting on top of a square surface. And that actually, and even the dome is encased by a giant box which is really, really interesting. Because, yeah, from an efficiency standpoint, squares always make much more sense. Uh, computers think in squares. We think in circles. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. Sorry, I'm actually looking at stuff here. There we go. Sorry. People are actually emailing. They're not emailing. Sorry, they're clicking on stuff. Okay. Anyway, um, okay, so that gives me a base model for this. Now, the sun and the moon... Yes. Uh, now the stars, uh, sun, moon, stars. I'm assuming you're going to tell me that this dome moves. The dome doesn't have to move. Uh, if oh, okay. it is the, pro- the projection on the dome can move. The projection on the dome can move. Again, no different than a planetarium, but okay. only with only with the stars and planets. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the sun and the moon appear to be much more interactive. Meaning, uh, and I'm, I'm going to throw in layman's terms out there, the, the sun appears to be an incandescent light bulb, for lack of a better term, and the moon appears to be its own light source. Uh, in fact, like, a, like an LED or a cool laser, if you've ever heard of those, where it's actually generating a cooling light, which is so unnatural to us uh, because we, you know, we, we don't have a household version of that. We have, you know, in, we have light bulbs all over the place. But we don't have, have any lights that you can shine on things and make them colder. Uh, and, and that's what we're, we're saying. Because, um, so the sun incandescent light bulb, the moon, its own light system, but it's completely self-generating. So the moon isn't reflecting anything from the sun. It is completely uh, separate in its relationship. Okay, gives me a rough idea then. Um, okay, so now where, if, if the stars are being projected... Uh, yes. They're being projected from this plane. You mean like inside or outside the structure? Uh, yeah, is it being projected from outside the structure onto the structure, or would it be from, let's say, the North Pole, which would make the most sense, onto as the planetarium does, onto, or is it from the ice shelf onto? Like, where would you project from? Uh, it could be either, but if you have the resources, uh, just to make it easy, I would do it from I would do it from up above. I mean, if, you, if the projection system is good enough, then uh, you, you'd want to make it uniform, and you'd also want to make it to where it couldn't be interfered with. Uh, so, yeah, I know, in a planetarium, you, you generally want to do it from down below. Uh, but that's just the limit of our technology. If we had, I think if we had our way, we'd, we'd, uh, if, the, we, if we had enough money to spend on a planetarium, we would install the screens on the ceiling. Uh, in fact, we've got pretty much we can do it now if we if we wanted to. You know, planetariums have been around since what the late '60s, early '70s. Uh, so, I, I think it's up above. I do. I, I don't think it's being projected from down below. But again, it's a minor point. Uh, you know, people are giving me crap for saying that the the moon is um, three dimensional, and other people said it's two dimensional. I go look. In the end, wherever it's discovered, I, I'm not gonna you know cry in a fetal position uh, just because I'm wrong. But uh, either way, it's it's a projection. Okay. So from there, I think we have a, a pretty decent construct that we can start going with questions. Gee, where do I start on this? <laughs> um, hey, Mike, do you have any questions? 
Just wanted to check if you're still alive. Um, I think let's start with the moon because that one seemed to, to be interesting. You said that according to uh, these concepts, actually, I'll back up one more because I think I should establish something else. Who made this? <laughs> wow, that's your opener? That's a good throw who made well, this thing? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's obviously a construct. If it's a construct, um, it, it, like, there's listeners out there that are probably coming from, and I, I hope there's some non-religious background, this yeah. is a construct. If it's a construct, somebody had to make it. If somebody made it, yes. who made it? You, you have an excellent point there. Um, here's the, here's the, the problem with that. When it comes to who made it, you really only have two choices. One, you have an advanced technology, you know, advanced civilization of some sort. It's definitely not us. Let's put it that way. Where this is way, way, way beyond us, and it's way, way older, uh, and it's been here since we've been around. Um, so it's either an advanced civilization, maybe a previous civilization, or it's a, you know, if you want to go down the religious side, it's the divine. And really, at that point, you're talking, still talking about an advanced civilization or an advanced being. So it's one of those two things. And I, I used to kind of joke, and I wasn't being glib when I said it, where it's like, you know, it's, it's you know, either God made it or God subcontracted it out. You know, if it's, if it's a small project, I mean, we still seem to think that this is a wonderful, great creation and all that, but maybe in the grand scheme of things, there are better ones. Uh, but yeah, uh, was it built by someone bigger than us? Yes. Uh, when that gets discovered, will that change everything? Yes, because then, uh, let, let's say, for example, uh, here's, here's, here's the problem with that. Once you, let's say you park a spaceship, I'm just going to throw the spaceship argument in there for, for the people that aren't religious. You park a spaceship next to the edge of this thing, right? And, and there's, you know, all sorts of glyphs on it and cool, cool stuff. Some people are going to see that as, wow, it's a sci-fi movie. It's a, it's a UFO thing. This is really, really great. Other people, though, will see it as the handprint of God. They'll see it as intelligent design. And who's right at that point? Because some people will say, well, the people in the spaceship made it. And then the church will go, how do we know? How do we know they're not lying and, and trying to deceive us? That's, you know, there, there is going to be a problem there. But, uh, you know, we'll have to deal with that when it comes. But that's, that's part of what we're kind of looking at now, and that is when this thing gets disclosed, what, what's the first perception? Because you only get one of those. You know, what's the perception that's going to be put across the population? And since 80% of the population is, you know, sucked you know, into the five major religions, which is uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, you know, and they're, they're going to have a big say on, on what it is. And they may, in some cases, see the divine no matter who says what. Anyway, so, sorry, that's my little yeah, I, now I'm, I'm assuming that most people, <clears throat> when they hear of, of this concept, that they're expecting that we're parked somewhere. And my thought that comes to mind, if I was constructing something, as we've described here, yeah. is this wouldn't be a parked item. This would be a transport vessel to move us from one place to another place where the simulation was designed to keep the populace as a whole from panicking uh, while the uh, the life of the planet went on, and when we arrived where we're supposed to arrive, then it would be made known and everybody could be unloaded. Very, very possible. No different than uh, the little um, sandwich bag that you carry a goldfish in from, from the store to your house. Uh, you know, the goldfish is fairly comfortable, and then, you know, you put them, you know, in the, in the tank, and then after a while you let them out. Um, yeah, there are some people that said, yeah, I, 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 and I, I, I dig the concept where, yeah, it could be a transit system from one place to another. No question. Uh, um, if it is I, a transit system, uh, and, and not that I want to add to the concept for you, but I'm going to add to the concept. If underneath this plane there are engines which are pushing us forward, yes. if you push the engines forward at a constant rate of acceleration, adding continuously, you would yep. be able to create uh, gravity. Yep. Some people have suggested that. Um, ah, you know, with something like this, I'd like to think that no matter what engine system, uh, whether it be unified field-based or not, I would think it would, 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 you would want it to be non-interactive with whatever environment is, is there, just in case you had any problems. Because up until now, we've never really had any uh, issues with any sort of sudden shifting in gravity or gradual shifting in gravity or, or anything along those lines. 
Well, we had that big tsunami back in what was it, 2006? No. Yes, yes, we did. Although Which uh, supposedly moved the planet from its place in orbit just a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a good story. So there you go. I don't yeah. know what caused it. That was nasty. Okay, yeah. I have pretty good parameters. Okay, let's start with. Um, you mentioned that the moon yes. was self was self lit. Yes. From inside or from outside? Inside. Okay. Uh, and I would, and normally I would have never even broached that subject. Uh, you know, if you would have told me seven months ago, I wouldn't have even touched it. But somebody had said, I think Eric Dubay actually was the guy, uh, another flat earther that originally had kind of hinted at it. But he basically said that the, the moon is a cooling light. And I didn't know what that meant. And so for people that are, that are just listening and haven't heard this, you can look this up. Uh, you know, the moon is a cooling light or, you know, there's different experiments in the flat earth. But we all know that, that if you're in the desert, let's say desert, that it's like, you know, when you hear it's like 100 degrees in the shade, but it's like 120, you know, if you're in the sunlight. That makes sense because if you're in the shade of the sun, it's going to be cooler. That's why shade is so nice. And that's, you know, we've got all sorts of little sayings for the shade. But in the moonlight, it's different. And by that mean, it's the exact opposite. Meaning, and, and I've, so I've watched the, the videos on this. It's, it's conclusive in my opinion, which is you take the moonlight. Let's say it's 50 degrees in the moonlight. Uh, and I'm not take, I'm talking Celsius or Fahrenheit. We're just going to take a number, 50 degrees in the moonlight. You walk over to the moon's shade, and it's 55 degrees in the moon's shade. And that doesn't make sense at first glance because you're going, well, it can't be actually warmer in the shade than it is in the light because if the moon is actually reflecting sunlight, then it should be reflecting at least a fraction of the radiation, the thermal radiation, and you should be feeling something. At the very least, it should not be warmer in the moon shade. Uh, and the reason why is it's becoming very popular, this test right now, is because of all those uh, digital thermometers where you can just point and click. You don't have to wait for anything. And... So I actually suggested during one of my shows, it just, just dawned on me, it's like, wow, that's really weird. I wonder what would happen, because we all know what happens when we take a magnifying glass out to the sunlight, we can burn a piece of paper or an ant or something, uh, and, and you know, it magnifies the, sun, the, the sun's rays and into a focal point. Well, if you take a magnifying glass in the moonlight, what happens exactly? Does it get warmer, or does it get colder? Because you're actually magnifying the cooling rays, and I'll be darned if that's exactly what happens. So if you take a magnifying glass and you know you put it like on a copper plate, you know, and you take regular moonlight and then take a magnifying glass of that moonlight and you focus it, it actually gets degrees colder, which again goes against everything that we've ever learned uh, when we were growing up. And so yeah, and so what that does is it's like does that prove flat Earth? What I just told you all that rattle off? No, of course it doesn't doesn't prove flat earth. But what it does do is it completely redefines what the moon is. You're looking at the moon at that point and saying, um, okay, so if the moon isn't reflecting the sunlight, where's the light coming from? And if it's self-illuminating, what the heck is the moon? Uh, and it's, it's, again, it's a fascinating concept. I, I highly recommend people look into it. Okay, so based on that, very interesting, by the way, with uh, regards to the temperature variance, because people can actually go outside and do that for themselves. Oh, yeah. um, if you take a picture, I, I have 25 years in graphic work, which is why I'm, I'm going to go this direction. Uh, if you take a picture of the moon and you zoom in on the picture, people can do that with their digital camera outside. If an object is lit from inside, and this is what you do, you go and look at, uh, pick a crater and zoom in on that crater. Pick a big one, you zoom yep. in. When you zoom in on that crater, if something's lit from inside, the interior of the crater would be lit, but it's not. It has shadows in it which uh, occur when an object is lit from the side, not from inside. If this was uh, self-illuminated, then the craters along this uh, ridge where you can see this would all be lit inside and then dark on the outside. It wouldn't be the other way around. Hmm. Not bad. Not bad. Unless, you know, does that still apply for, say, a uh, holographic projection? Or you can no, project... This and this is one thing that I, I will agree with you 100%. If you told me that we were all living in a digital matrix, I would believe you 100%. Oh, all right. Because I, I can't prove we're not. And there's things that happen that you, you have to say, hmm, is that a glitch in the matrix? So, yeah. 
That one yeah. I can do yeah. for. Yeah, and again, that's a whole other layer to this, uh, which exactly. you know, you know, I, I'd love to go into that, but unfortunately, mm-hmm. you know, I. I, I'll start losing people, uh, you know, because I, I've mentioned, I, and I, I don't want to cop out by using the matrix too many times. Uh, but yeah. yeah, there are some, some interesting, interesting things. But when it comes, I'll, I'll throw one more out at you, and that is sure. when it comes to a holographic thing, I'll use the old one because you're, you're, I know you're not that old, but uh, you're old enough to probably remember Star Trek Next Generation. And that is. No, I'm Star- old enough for Star Trek. Okay, Star, Star Trek Next Generation, everyone knows what the holodeck was, but right. most people don't remember what shape it was. And that mm-hmm. was, it was, it was square. Right, which it was, is you know, a way to do the projections. Exactly, it's a square room. And uh, so, you know, how, much, how easy would it be to, to make, um, you know, something like this inside a giant square room? All you mm-hmm. need is the, the power. But anyway, it, the, you, know, you know where I was going with that. Yeah. Um, now, People seem to have a problem with the fact that the moon is tidal locked to the Earth. And we use the word tidal locked because it means that that one face is always facing to the planet. Why do people have trouble with that in the flat Earth concept? Like, why is it so hard for that? Because, I mean, if you look um, at Jupiter and you you watch it, and you can do this with with a small telescope, like a six-inch Newtonian, over the days... um, Four of those planets, sorry, four of those moons are tidal locked to Jupiter. So it's not an uncommon thing. And I just was curious why they seem to have so much trouble with them. Well, because as far as the layers of coincidences go, it's just one more that that really kind of bugs people. Um, on top of being, well, okay, let's put it this way. You combine that, the fact that, for people who don't know what you just said there, uh, hmm. the fact that the moon never is is yeah is locked meaning the rotation the the rotation of the moon perfectly coincides with the rotation of the earth so that we never see the other side of the moon mm-hmm. ever and if astronomically it is a, you know you, you'd think that i don't know over over 10 years over 50 years over 100 years you'd see some sort of variance there that that part does bug people but you combine that with the fact that the distance of the moon, uh, the, the, the distance of the, between us, uh, I'm sorry, be, the width of the moon compared to the width of the sun, and then the distance of the moon compared to the distance of the sun to where when the, sun, when the moon passes in front of the sun, it's perfectly, you know, that it perfectly covers it. Yeah, between those two, yeah, it bugs people. Now, is, is it a complete flat earth thing that, that, that I think, it's like, a, I, it's fact, it's, it's so far down on my list I don't really pay attention of it to it, but it does, yeah, it does raise a few bells in, in my uh, in my book. But for me, the moon has absolutely no effect on the tides. It's uh, the if this thing is an artificial mechanism, uh, all the tidal forces are controlled from down below. Okay, now how do we know then that the, the tidal forces are not moon based? Oh, we don't. But you you wouldn't let's put it this way: if the moon is only let's say. Uh, instead of being thousands of miles, well, what is it? It's a couple thousand oh, I'm miles sorry, away. you're saying based on the idea of it being a non-globe. But yeah, system. yeah, yeah. I mean, if, it, if that if that moon is only 30 miles wide, it's, it's not doing much in the way of affecting the water. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah. I mean, I I just had to throw the tidal thing just out. But right. it's it's easy it's easy to do if everything else is mechanical anyway. Well, yeah, uh, everything. If you're in a little mechanical thing, now I have a question for you on that while we're we're working with that. I didn't ask before, how far in front of the sun is the moon? That we don't know, uh, because we, we, we're still trying to figure it out. The reason, uh, there, the reason I there's ask this, that yeah. is if it, there's some problems that come in with like a solar eclipse where the moon passes in front of the sun, yep. and you get a full solar. If the moon is anywhere near the sun, and you figure the angles of the dangles, um, way more people on the planet would be able to see a full solar or part of this full solar eclipse than presently do because the angles, if you, if you mark out what you did, even if you create an 8,000 foot dome and, and, and do all of the stuff that goes with it and then just draw, you will see that way more of the planet would actually be able to see that occurrence than presently see those occurrences. Yeah. Yeah. There's people have been scrambling ever since ever since this thing started last year of trying, trying to work in different models. 
I'm getting a little echo. Can, can you hear that? Maybe not. I can hear that. I don't know what's going on there, but it's that that's okay. I'll I'll try to power through it. Um, the um, they've been trying to work out exactly the the sun and the moon models. What we do know more or less is that at the very least, the 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 sun and the moon travel in uh, never identical circles around the top of this thing. Uh, you know, around the around the plane, it's sort of like um, um, a needle on a record player how, you know, the grooves, it goes closer in and then moves closer, you know, then moves farther out. But there could be more than one object, uh, you know, as far as the, representing the sun and the moon, as far as we know. Uh, there's so many little nuances. Again, we're still trying to figure out, like, for example, uh, the blood moons. Uh, the, I'm amazed more people don't ask me about the blood moons, and that is the blood moons shouldn't even be possible if, we're on a um, on a flat Earth because there's no Earth between the sun and the moon. Right. Therefore, the moon shouldn't be darkened. And uh, then I come back and say, well, unless the moon is its own projection system, in which case it just projects a red tinted version of itself. Yeah, but that you see, that's too easy to get away with. It's like when I, I talk to people and they go, because God made it that way. Uh, yeah, yeah but I'm not. But I'm not going down that way. Yeah, I know. I, but what I mean is, as soon as you say it's projecting. Then the question comes in, for what purpose? Because if, um, if this is a construct, yeah. and I don't have a problem with that, then there has to be a purpose to each construct. And, to, uh, to each part of it, you mean? Yeah, to each part of a construct. When you build a bicycle, you have parts that do parts. When you build a car, each part has a function. And when you build a planet and terraform it, each part has a function. Everything yep. within the biological structure has a function. They all interlink. So when you have the moon go um, and is easily explained by the light passing through the atmosphere and curving because it's a lens around and causing that moon to go that color, uh, and it's a simple answer to it, if we go to the flat earth theory, we, we can't just brush by. We have to say, okay, there has to be a purpose for each of these systems. Yeah. And I and I cannot, for the life of me, figure out why anyone. There's a couple of, of things in the system I can't figure out a purpose for. One of them is, well, the solar eclipses. I, that, that's weird, um, unless you want to scare the population. Um, the only thing I can come up with for the blood red moons is it gives um, certain Christian authors the ability to suck money from people, uh, producing books that don't come true. Do I sound a little angry about that? I've been reeling against that. No, it's okay. Um, but no, I, I do have an answer for you there. Um, okay. uh, although, and, and I'm not going to use um, too much of the biblical stuff, but uh, and I won't be able to quote chapter and verse. But you, you, you can anyway because I work in ancient Hebrew, so have fun. Oh, okay. Well, you you probably or may or may not have heard the, the early stories about how uh, when this place was first built, and I don't mean the civilization that we're living in now. I'm talking one of the, the the earlier versions. So if we're in version 6.0 or 7.0, the early versions were was was very simple uh, in terms of the display. Like there was only light and dark. You know, the sky got lighter and the sky got darker. No difference in some of the the games we have built. You know, some of our early games. And then it's like, okay, well now we're going to put a sun in, and then we're going to do a moon thing, and then the stars. That'll be kind of fun. Add those too, and then you can add the subtle stuff like you know changing the moon color. Uh, like, you know, doing a, doing a solar eclipse. And, yeah, they don't do much for us now. It's like if we take a few pictures. But you go back several thousand years ago, and those things really rattle people's lives and have the, the ability to change history, depending well, on... Uh, exactly. You know, but you're not going to be able to control how that history has changed when that moon goes. New? No, unless you had boots in the ground, unless you, you know, had waves. I mean, I'm sure you're not going to let it go completely. You know, but if you're an if you're an advanced uh, uh, if you're an advanced sentient race, yeah. screwing with people on the ground isn't exactly you know the way that a sentient race should be going about it. Well, yeah, yeah, but unless every, we're an experiment. There you go. Uh, that's it, and it does feel like you know part school, part experiment a lot of the time, mm -hmm. where people. Uh, yeah, I mean, think of, think of this, and and I actually touched on this in one of my clues which was the, the one thing that's very, very unique about any civilization that, that gets raised from the ground up is their uh, creative novelty. 
and that is not just the creative stuff when it comes to uh, technology, you know, the, the art of war and, and all, the, all the different uh, things you can build, you know, which, you know, invariably happen, but also the, 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 the pure creative arts, uh, you know, um, music, dance, literature, uh, pictures and sculptures, which, is, uh, which gets changed depending on the environment. So, you know, you put a few more stars in the sky, you inspire people differently. A few less, uh, you know, a few less cataclysms, a few more. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of wonderful things that I think every civilization can bring, uh, even though uh, it appears that in, in our case, we seem to, uh, again, I don't want to steal too much from Agent Smith in uh, The Matrix, but he said mm. that we seem to um, define our reality based on, you know, levels of misery and suffering. Mm. Uh, and some of our best artwork has been, and I put this in one of my clues, have, have been produced be, in the midst of all that strife, whether it be war or famine or you know, personal tragedy or whatever it is. Uh, but anyway, getting, I'm getting off a little, uh, off a little top, topic there. But yeah, to, to, to circle back, if, you wanted, you know, if, if I had a reason for putting the stars in the sky or making blood moons or anything like that, it would just be for a, a, a subtle little nuance for the civilization to affect them in a way that maybe even I didn't know the outcome. So basically, it's, it's an experiment then. It feels like it, Ooh, but it's it's, it's not it's not just it can't be just an experiment though, because there's there seems to be more. We would hope to it. not. Well, yes, of course. I I mm-hmm. you know I try to be an optimist. I don't don't want to think that it ends like a lot of uh, episodes of the Twilight Zone, where you know it's, it becomes a sinister, horrible, horrible thing. Uh, it does feel like school sometimes. Uh, it does feel like entertainment sometimes. Uh, it does feel like a like a spiritual recharge of okay. sorts. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we could go on and on. Yeah, some something that uh, because I've actually I've talked with people around um, in the town here to get the reaction towards the concept because nobody up here has heard of that concept. Uh, they thought that was something from like uh, the 12th century, and let's move on. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions I asked him is, what's the point? Like, what does it matter? And every single person that I asked that question to said no. It doesn't until, uh, okay, uh, the short version of that, the answer to that is, it doesn't until it does. Meaning, until it actually becomes a reality to where uh, it becomes a public conscious issue, then, yeah, because I, I get the same emails every freaking week where people will come back and they'll say, uh, you know, I still, who, what does it matter whether it's round or flat? I still get, have to go to my crappy job in the morning and <laughs> I can stuff. And, and I get that. I totally get that. It's like, well, I'm still going to my commute. My wife still hates me. You know, my kids are awful. You know, what's, what's that going to change? And I'll go, okay, there's three ways it's going to change. And you'll, you'll get this. Uh, the, the first way is going to be uh, ec- uh, educationally. And that is, just from a surface level, the education system will be absolutely rocked uh, off its, off its freaking core. Meaning, again, uh, and you, you, you know, you'll know some of these right off the bat, and that is you're at any, every college, every college, and there are thousands of them, every college that has an astrophysics or an astronomy department, those departments are gone instantly, overnight. Well, this part I understand, but what I'm, what I'm looking at more is, okay, so... You and I, you believe in flat earth. I believe in round earth. It, yeah. doesn't, feed, it doesn't feed any starving kids in Africa. But it, but it would if it actually became a flat earth. But it wouldn't because the powers that be, they're still not going to give them the money. And it's not them that we have to wait for. I'm, I'm, when I look at flat earth, round earth, I'm starting to say to myself, all this is is a diversion from really what matters because um, I can believe in the round earth or the flat earth, all I want, and I can find every working mechanism of how it's done and what it's done, but I, I can't do any more after that other than know and then teach other ones. And so everybody on the planet tomorrow knows flat earth is real and the kids are still starving. And but, they, until, but, they, but, they wouldn't, but they wouldn't for that much longer. And, here, and here's why. Why wouldn't they? Sure. Be, because it changes and from the individual standpoint it doesn't seem to change that much but from a group standpoint from a population standpoint it changes everything and by that i mean if it was built and i don't want to play too heavy-handed with the religious angle here but if it was built that means it was created if it was created there was a creator 
And whether you see them or not, once you know there was a creator involved, then all of a sudden looking over your shoulder becomes a lot more literal. And by that I mean, are you going to do the same things that you did before knowing that you may be accountable for your actions? Uh, uh, the, the perfect example I, I put in one of, one of my clues, I think it was Clue 11, which was uh, the, the traffic light thing. And that is, we've all used to run traffic lights. We've all done it. But once they started installing cameras of those traffic lights, you didn't do it anymore. Why not? Because you're going to get caught. Well, why were you thinking about doing it in the first place then? It changes your frame of mind. Even if you think the camera might be broken, you're still mm -hmm. not going to roll those dice. And by that I mean, it starts out slow. And that is, from a military standpoint, are you really going to go to war it is, you know, but I have to stop you on that point, and I'll tell you why. If knowing that you're being watched changes what you do, then yes. why the powers that be who are in collusion to keep all of this from us, who know, as you say, that it is a flat earth, yeah. they're not being nice. It's not affecting them. In fact, obviously, they're evil bastards, and the knowledge that they're being watched isn't changing them at all well there are some people that unfortunately are rather resistant to the whole concept of a conscience uh, and and as far as how many people actually know this very very few do they care unfortunately here's here's the problem there the seduction of power when it comes to men Absolute is, power corrupts absolutely. Yeah, they, they don't they're, they're willing to take the risk in that case. Okay. It's like, you know so, what, I will they'll they'll do it. The average person on the street though, no. They so want, this, and especially this, women. Here's what's gonna happen tomorrow. Everybody yeah. knows flat earth is real and this is a construct. Yeah. And then the powers that be will say, We were trying to keep this from you. The aliens have built this, they're keeping us prisoner in here, so we need to arm to the T and prepare because they're coming to eat us. Yeah, that's a good. That's and a, you thought about this? Did you just think about that just now? Well, I just I'm sitting here and thinking I watched too many. Uh, no, no, of, no, because because I was thinking I've been thinking of plot lines along that train of thought, which is you could you could get out of it if you were the authority if you just passed the buck and yeah. said, look, we lied to you, but here's why we lied to you. Exactly. You know, we were told we were told that in a hundred years or whatever they were going to come back or whatever year it was, and they were going to come back and they were going to take us out. And we were told that it's like that we weren't supposed to upset anybody, but apparently you found on it on your own. So yeah, no, it's not a that's not a bad one because hey, we could call it Jupiter ascending. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, no, you you got an excellent point because several people have said, why now? Why is this topic even being allowed to? to go through the alternative media. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the deeper flat earthers, the ones that have been in it for a while, they've thought the same thing. And that is, there's no way. It feels like a setup. It feels like there's something else. Not a sign. It's up. a setup. I can tell yeah. them right now it's a setup. You see, everybody it, posts all their stuff online. And the government marks down who's a flat earther, and away we go. Well, but it's it's more than that. It's resonating. It's resonating too quickly for it just to be like you know. Oh, let's let's do a registry of who who actually is buying into flat Earth because there's a lot of people buying into it, and there's a lot of closet people buying into it. You know why people I think that, everybody's buying in? I think everybody's buying in right now because number one, they're bored with their real life. They're scared of the future, and as you say, knowing or believing that this is a construct, you can believe that there is a God, and if there is a God, then he's going to save your butt if this all goes down the crapper. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, so there's basically, different... we're all doing it for selfish reasons. Yeah, well, I, but there's some people, though, that, I mean, I've, I've received a whole bunch of very, very sincere emails. And, sure. the, and you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of good people out there. It's the mass I'm worried about, because... Uh, Brad used to say uh, something to me. He said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to worry. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that, or, or the line from uh, uh, 2012, the movie with John Cusack. <laughs> you know, when the authority tells you not to panic, that's when you run. That's when you run. Yep. Yeah. The, um, but you know the... the, the <laughs> Hello, the, I'm the governor of California. It's going to be okay. 
Yeah, yeah. You, I can assure you, there will be there's nothing actor. to worry about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The the group though that that really caught my eye when this thing started taking off, uh, because they've got a good BS meter, is and I've never seen this in the conspiracy world, and I you know I've looked at just about everything, is the women, uh, the the female side of this. There are a lot of women that you know it, there's a line and i don't want to i don't want to be crude here but it's very very true I, I saw i heard this in a movie but it's absolutely true and that is when you're pitching when you're trying to sell people over the phone uh, there's a telemarketer saying and that is you don't pitch the bitch because women will see through bs and they won't make snap judgments and they'll weigh decisions and and women have really latched on to this thing for whatever reason you know call it a message of i can tell you right now why they would latch on i, I can almost guarantee that the largest quantity of them are most likely Christian. A lot and, of them are, yes. And they're looking for proof of that, uh, because if you look at Christianity worldwide, it is losing membership badly, because anybody can go on the net right now, and, uh, and they can look up and find out that uh, in the book of Mark, Jesus uh, was on the cross by 9 a.m., and in the book of John at noon, they're still debating what they're going to do with them. And they're starting to see that there are errors throughout the texts, and so they're starting to have great doubts. Yeah. And so when you come along with this construct uh, and, and say that there's proofs for this construct, they need this construct to be real, which, you know, I don't blame people for that. But what I do say to people is you don't just latch on to anything without without being able to prove the points. And yeah. there was a great quantity of points here that uh, when Zen and I were going through it, because as you said, Zen was writing the book, or yeah. sorry, Michael said Zen was writing the book, and um, he would write me the stuff, and I'd write back and say, well, no, but you can't do this, because somebody's going to ask this question, like, um, when the sun rises in the east, if it's 20,000 miles from me, and it's only 8,000 miles tall on this plane, the sun would rise as a star, then it would become the size of the sun overhead of me if I was in the middle of this construct, and then when it set, it would go back to the size of a star again because of its distance from me. And each person I've talked to about that, nobody's been able to explain um, how the sun can be the same size no matter where it is in the sky, no matter what time it is. If I take a picture of the sun, and bring it in, take another picture of the sun when it's setting, and bring them in, they're exactly the same size. Hmm. And so that's the kind of stuff that nobody's been able to answer, because if you use the spherical 92 million miles away and the sun is monstrous, that works. But if you, we have a construct here, mm -hmm. I haven't been able to figure out a way to make that work. I, I've drawn multiple models down, but no matter how I do it, because people are strewn all the way across this plane, certain people will see a small sun, like a star in the morning and big in the evening when it sets, or they'll see a star uh, in, in the morning and big at noon and a star at night if you're in the middle, or if you're on the other side, you see it big when it rises and then a star when it sets. I can't make that work no matter how hard I try. Sure, sure. And I, I mean, I could, I could give you a cop-out answer and uh, say that, you know, if you combine it with some sort of software instancing and vary the light source intensity, you might be able to fudge some stuff here and there. I don't know. I it, really don't know how And it works. you know what? If the population was in a central location, yeah. we could get away with that. We could. Sure. But because it's strewn over the whole plane, I cannot make a model work where the sun remains and the moon remains constant. Uh, the other problem I had was if the dome is, let's say, only 8,000 feet, and out to the side, as the moon <clears throat> would go across, if, if, if it's a sphere, if it's a disk, who knows, but you would see the side of it. As it started to set, you would start to, you know what I mean, the further it gets away from you, sure. you would actually see more of the edge as it was going down if it was a close object. And yeah. these, these are the kind of observational things that I've had that I haven't been able to get past and Zen wasn't able to uh, do them for me. And so I figured maybe tonight, and, and if you don't have the answer, that's fine. I'm, I'm not going to say, hey, you're, you know, you're a horrible man. You don't have an answer. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'd respect you more if you said, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I don't. I can only tell you what we use uh, in software. 
you know, when we're building simulations. Uh, you know, we, we use it strictly, we use instances, which is, you know, the realization of an object, and we base it on region. Yeah. So, so in which case, uh, the argument I gave to people some months ago was, uh, was this. If, imagine you're in a planetarium, uh, and this one's a fairly advanced one. You're on one end, your buddy's on the other end, you're talking to each other via cell phone. Yeah. And he's saying, hey, I'm looking at the belt of Orion. And you're saying, oh, yeah, I'm looking at the belt of Orion, too. But in reality, you're both looking at completely different belts of Orion, but you don't know that because you're being, you're being shown what you're supposed to be shown depending on where you are via region, uh, in which case you could do almost unlimited things when it comes to uh, the sky, which is for me, it's like the sky is, let's put it this way, I'd love to iron out the details of, of everything that's going on in the sky. Uh, unfortunately, I, you know, there's some things we're not going to know until we actually know. Uh, but it's it, for me, it's a, a relative, not necessarily a minor point, but it's like a second tier or third tier point compared to everything else that we're seeing, mm -hmm. everything okay. else that we're looking at. But it's but they're good points. I like while we're, while we're on the sun, mm -hmm. sunspots. Um, I yep. can go out and watch the sunspots, photograph them as the sun sets each day. Yep. Uh, and uh, they go across the sun, and then uh, a couple of well. As NASA, heaven forbid, said that the sun revolves in X amount of time, those same sunspots come back around the sun again. Sure. Um, and a lot of flat earthers, like I say, if we're in an, an interior and that's a light bulb, mm -hmm. what are the sunspots? Because when I take my six-inch Newtonian and zoom in on that baby and take a picture of it, that's, that's a nasty big item. First off, why is it moving? There's no need for this bulb to be moving. Uh, why second, not? What would be the purpose? Oh, just just a little detail, a little uh, you know, extra brush stroke on the yeah, canvas. But, why, well, why not? Why not have it moving? But what would be the purpose? You see, each time that I say, if if an advanced race or an advanced being built this, when people reach that level of advancement they not only create things for beauty, but they create things for function and beauty so that everything has a place and purpose, which, like every biologic on this planet, has a place and purpose and is linked in. And you remove one of them, and the chain starts falling apart. Sure. I, so, I got, I, no, I have an answer for you. The, um, how, about, how about this? Because I, I probably should have touched on this earlier. Sure. The, the only way this thing works as far as, okay, let's, let's, let's go back real quick, just a super quick recap. Sure. And that is, 40 for first 4,500 years of our civilization, we, it just about, you know, every religion, every culture, every tribe thought the earth was flat. You know, it was covered in this great canvas. You know, everybody had their own word for it, and the stars were up there and did all this thing. But at some point, I believe that whoever built this place had to change it. They had to buy them. You, you got to buy some time. It buys you extra time. If you let the population believe, you know, it's easy enough to introduce the idea, let them believe it's a globe. Meaning, because if they believe it's a globe, and I touched on this in the clues, then you don't look for the edge. You give up looking for the edge. It doesn't, it, exploring only goes as far as whatever you know. And so if it's a circuit, you know, if it's a sphere, then, you know, there's, there's no place to go. There's no place left to explore. Therefore, you don't have to concentrate on the edge. So any little things that reinforce the sphere model, uh, you know, be it the, uh, the equator or the weather patterns or the sun or the moon, in this case, sunspots, mm -hmm. watching, you know, the sun rotate, that sort of thing, right. that just reinforces the globe model. Okay, uh, so basically then, and I don't want to say this, but I, I'm going to have to, those ladies out there listening right now, you just told them that God is lying to us because he's trying to keep stuff from us. Is it a malicious lie, or is God protecting us from something? Is God protecting us from something on the outside, or is, is he protecting us from, some, from us getting out and doing something to whatever's on the outside? Maybe why, there's a wouldn't, paradise. why wouldn't God just say, hey, guys, hi, uh, this is what I did, and this is why, and uh, so hang tough, this is what's going to happen, and we'll get you out of here. Free will. I think eventually, okay, okay, I, I can answer that because uh, it was something I touched on before, sure. which is 
I think it was supposed to be part of the natural process, in which case it's not really a lie if it was never going to be, you know, hidden forever, if it was just, you know, going to be out there for a little while. And that was, I think, eventually we, the population was supposed to naturally find this. Maybe, you know, not, not necessarily as early as the 1950s, but definitely no later than, like, say, the 1970s or maybe the early 1980s, you know, just ran some random explorer going around. But once it was discovered that it was artificially, then the timeline was artificially delayed by the powers that be here, most notably the Soviet Union and the United States, from 1956 until right now. But unfortunately, they, you can't hide something like this forever. You can't hide. You can hide a lot of things. You can bury them in the desert. No one's ever going to see them again. But you can't hide. This is like hiding things from your roommate. You, we're all, we all live here. And since the technology, you can only retard the, the technology, especially detection technology, for so long. Uh, which is why right now it appears to be breaking down. Which uh, is, explains meteors? Oh, meteors are easy. I, 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 in fact, my, uh, my, uh, my, my co-host... My, really, my co-host well, well, meteors, meteors are definitely a part of the creation process. You know, okay. uh, Jonathan joked that it was, it was somebody throwing rocks into the fish tank. Uh, or, or throwing them into the terrarium, which is, look, I mean, it's easy enough to do, and it is a very slick reinforcement tool. And that is to take a piece of metal ore, introduce it at speed, shallow trajectory, let friction do the work, try not to aim for any major cities, which is why that thing in Russia was all so fun a few years back. And that's it. And that's really, but, but I'll, I'll, let me counter with this, and that is, speaking of meteors, with all the satellites that are supposedly up there, why isn't anyone ever concerned if there's a meteor shower coming out of, I don't know, supposedly random directions all over the solar system, and these coming in through the atmosphere and nobody loses a satellite? You'd think that people would be watching television and those screens would go dark all the time because meteors would just, you know, just pound the place. Uh, you know, the, there should be anywhere, depending on who you talk to, anywhere between three and 20,000 satellites up there. And yet, you know, not only do I not see any pictures of them, but nobody loses any of them. So well, I think, I, yeah, I, I can go with I can go with why nobody loses satellites, uh, and one of them would be um, the fact that a, a meteor, when it's in space, is not moving super fast. It's not until it reaches um, the gravitational force of the Earth that it starts getting pulled in. So what happens is it's a slow increase. It doesn't come sucking along at high speed and smack a satellite because satellites are outside of the atmosphere. You know, the speed gets picked up as these things are passing by, so they will pull down into the planet. The speed is not – it's different than people think it is, if you, if you work out the math on that. But my Even, question, my okay, question okay. is, uh, each year I can look forward to the Pleiades and other meteor showers at a specific time. The meteor count goes up to uh, sometimes up to 100, sometimes 200 meteors an hour that can be visible from here. And uh, always after midnight – when the Earth is turning toward the rising sun, those meteors become very visible. They're not before midnight. They, they, there's very few of them. Why would Creator tell one of his angels to take a bunch of rocks and go up in the air every August and throw one to 200 rocks at the Earth every year from the constellation of Leo? Why not? Exactly. In fact, it does, you don't have to ask people to. It's an automated process. No different yeah, than... Uh, yeah, but, but, but what's the purpose? I mean, that's, that's really weird. That's like me saying to my kid, okay, you see the goldfish out there? Yeah. Uh, I want you to take some little pebbles and go out to our pond every August and throw some um, rocks in because it'll be fun to scare the goldfish. I don't know. Like There has to be a purpose. Is, is it... But it's a, it's kind of an interesting balance between, let's say, fear and inspiration. Uh, I think I think it's worth it. It's not I'm, not. I'm not inspired by a shooting star. I mean, I might you know, like you could make a wish, but it's it doesn't change anything. And this is what I don't understand. <laughs> Sorry, somebody That's emailed right. me and goes because it's fun. Um, it's. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't change your life, but there are some people that get really really uh, jazzed up by by meteors. I mean, it's I'm, it's a neat little design, you know. Yes, that's the thing. But when I'm looking at an intelligent construct, yes, um, throwing meteors instead of feeding the populations who are starving to death with little babies, that's kind of cruel, God. 
Well, you know, if you want to get into theology, uh, let's, let's look at it a different way, and that is, is there anything, because I firmly believe that the flat earth could introduce a new golden age, because I think us crimes against humanity, man on man, uh-huh. atrocities, oh. I think well, I think they would be redru- be reduced by a huge amount if the flat Earth thing was actually revealed. Meaning, meaning to your point, what is what is happening now and all the bad things that are happening in this world? That's us. Yeah, I mean, God is not. I don't think God's taking a blind uh, taking a blind eye to this. I mean, He knows full well what's going on. But really, is, do, is there anyone to bl- blame down here but us? Um, I could introduce stuff from our work to explain it. Do you, do you have a few minutes? From from what? Uh, from the work that we do at the Chronicle Project. Sure. Um, with the Chronicle Project, uh, and just for the listeners out there who don't know, uh, with some work we did, we discovered that ancient Hebrew is not supposed to be uh, functioning the way that they presently do it. What a shock. And that it actually works on a glyph system with a, a concept to each of the shapes more like uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. When we took this back and translated or restored the book of Genesis, that book that was there, and people can go to our website at the chronicleproject.org and read it, um, what it says is that first off, the earth's been around a lot longer than um, we say because it was not created at that time. It says it was already here. They left some words out um, in the Hebrew and said that they aren't to be translated. And we had creators show up with uh, a group called the Originators. They terraformed this planet. They put an atmosphere on the planet. And uh, then they took the waters on the planet and they put water into the upper atmosphere to moisturize the air and create clouds. And then they took the atmosphere and drove it into the water where it would remain independent in the water so that the sea life could breathe. And then, once all of the planet was constructed and mankind was constructed, and Adam, or the Adam, the humans, who in ancient Hebrew the word means to rule those, the second in command, who was called the Nakash, saw an opening using the law to steal the planet from Creator. And so he got the Adam to uh, break the rule of not eating from the tree which gives information And instead, they went and they did it. And when they did it, they translated to the form of the originators. And when Creator came and found what had happened, he said, do you realize that by not taking my command and taking his instead, you can't uneat what you ate. He's now your commander from now on. And because you're the rulers of the earth, and because you're under him, he now owns the earth, and I legally can't interfere here without a human asking me to. And that's why bad things happen to good people, because the Nakash is in control. If you're bored, you can you can read our stuff sometimes. It's a real mind screw. No, no, that's that's interesting. I like that. It's good stuff. Now, to put that into the flat Earth thing, if it is a flat Earth, mm-hmm. it's the Nakash keeping everybody from knowing it's flat. Hmm. But then again, it could be a ball. <laughs> Uh, that'd be a that'd be a tough uh, tough stretch at this point, I think. So where where I come from in my daily life is this: it doesn't matter if the if the world is flat or if the world is round. What does matter is that we're prisoners. Well, and and some people have have touched on that and said, you know, is it is it a prison planet? But I try, you know, I I try Ooh, to be the optimist here. That'd be a great name for a website. What prison planet? <laughs> yeah, go yeah. figure. Yeah. Uh, the, um, uh, I mean, yeah, some people have touched on that. No, no question. And for me, again, because you can only go one of two ways, and I'm, I'm not going to ride the fence on it. I try to you know, do the, the glass half full thing, and that is I try to look at it like a, uh, a box of kittens type thing where we are being kept safe because what's outside of here, whatever it is, we're not ready for. However, you go to the other side, and you could say that maybe, you know, there's actually three ways. The other is we're a box of kittens and we're trapped. You know, we're going to be exploited. But the third way is, of course, that, that we're actually not a box of kittens at all, that we're a box of scorpions. And we're and you've seen movies. I mean, good Lord, go back to the, the, the day the earth stood still, back to the 50s. 
yeah. you know, where they said, yeah, you guys aren't going to be exploring anything because you guys are just going to mess it all up. Uh, how many movies have we seen that in? They all say the same thing, and that is you guys, the, the, that human beings just simply are far too dangerous. <laughs> that being said, though, I think it's, it's only because we don't have a unified cause to go against. I think we, we've got a lot of nobility if we have a unified uh, mission. So but a one, one world government sounds like a great idea. Well, oh, oh no, wait, somebody else came up with that idea. Too late. <laughs> uh, I, and and I, I, you know, I'll be the first one to say it, uh, which is, you know, if you wanted to build a one world government, you know, introducing a flat earth concept would be a great starting point once you got everything in, in place, because that's one of the default effects of creating the flat earth. And that is yeah. once, once it, you know, people realize it's like, oh yeah, by the way, you're all in the same boat you immediately become one world. You become unified just just because you're there. And you're the all... problem is, no matter what you do, no matter how good intentioned you are, yeah. somebody will take this and use it for evil. Yeah, there is the potential. Doesn't for that. that suck? That's one yeah. of the big worries about our work, is the fact that we restored the ancient Hebrew and, and we found out that this language could not have been done by human beings because it's a three-dimensional language that you can literally check. It has its own meaning. meaning. Each word has its own meaning built in that can be found backwards, forwards, or taken apart multiple ways. You can't uh, screw this language up if you know how it works. So we restore the text, and I'm just waiting for somebody to take these texts, start some kind of new church or synagogue, and wreck it all again. And that's my big worry. Yeah. So I hope I hope it doesn't happen. Um, we should get back to to the stuff people are listening because they're like, oh hey, yeah yeah yeah. Oh, sure. Okay, the outpost effect. Do you know what that is? No. Out, I'm sorry. Out outpost yeah. effect? No, sorry. The outpost effect. Uh, hit sorry. Me, hit me. What do you got? Uh, e O T. I'll let you. I'll let you Google. E O T. Yeah. V O S. Effect and Wiki should have a. A, a thing, please. I don't know if anyone's ever. I, I know people all. Oh, no, talk about oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There we go. The, okay, good. The perceived gravitational force causes blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. The, the Coriolis effect as it affects ballistics. Yeah. Well, not not Coriolis, but the Oedipus effect, which uh, is slightly different. A uh, German team in, in around the 1900s in the Institute of uh, Geodesy in, yeah. in Potsdam. Uh, they carried out gravity measurements on moving ships in the Atlantic and the Indian Pacific Oceans. And uh, created a device, and when they traveled one way, uh, there was less gravity. When they traveled the other way, there was more gravity. And it was an experiment that showed that the Earth was turning. Unless it wasn't. Um, then the effect would then the effect would have been the same both ways, and it wasn't. And they've redone this multiple times, and each time they've done it, the tests have come out the same. You know, when you're starting with the globe model, uh, you know, an effect like that, okay, let's put it this way. Uh, let, me, let me take it a different way for you. And that is that I don't know how much you know about the people that have come forward that I've, that I've interviewed about this stuff. But I have yet to find any modern military guy, and, I, and I've talked to U.S. Navy missile instructor. Well, let's, let's, let's start from the bottom up. Um, sure. Because we've seen mainstream media talk, especially uh, in movies, about how that – the, um, the the turning of the earth, you know, that, that snipers at, at, at over a mile have to use the the, the rotation of the earth in, in their co- their calculations. Yeah. I've run into a United States Marine Corps sniper instructor three years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He goes, it's not there. We don't teach it. United States Army artillery radar operator out of Afghanistan says yeah. we're shooting at 30 miles. It's not there. Mm-hmm. Uh, got another artillery guy out of Fallujah, 30 miles, not there. Submarine chief shooting uh, torpedoes at 25 miles. He goes, none of, and missiles. Firing solutions do not take it into account. And most notably, um, the, the, you know, my, the, the guy I love the most right now is the um, United States, States Navy missile instructor using the Sparrow missile system, where they're painting... It, he, where they're using, co- they're using combination of things. Yeah, you and, paint the target with a laser. Yeah, the computer, paint, uh, does the, the computer does yeah. all of the guesswork. 
Exactly. So okay. his paint has been targeted 60 miles, mm-hmm. but he's but he goes one. He goes, we shouldn't even be able to paint the target at 60 miles because it should be below the curvature because we're not bouncing it off the ionosphere. It's a straight two inch pencil beam. Okay. And the second thing he goes, the firing solution doesn't have the Coriolis effect. I am waiting for anyone in the military sector that has to deal with ballistics. Right now, I've got artillery, I've got I've got torpedoes, I got missiles, I got snipers. Okay. They all say the same thing, and they're saying, yeah, look, it doesn't work. Uh, so, based on that, I did an interesting experiment. I have a, a friend in town, and he is he's, uh, probably one of the best hunters out here I have ever seen. I mean, this guy can hit with a crossbow at 400 yards, uh, his target dead center. He's the most amazing person I've ever seen shoot stuff. He has the largest collection of weaponry and stuff that I've ever seen. Really uh, knows everything that there is about ballistics. So I went out and I said, Ken, do we need to adjust for the movement of the Earth? And he said, uh, not until you're at 1,000 yards. And I said, can you prove it to me? He said, sure. So we took two targets and we put them out at 1,000 yards, and then we mounted one of his high-powered ones onto a fixed table so that it absorbed all of the... And the gun that he has absorbs the recoil. It's really an amazing thing. And we put it on the table, locked it down, and then he allowed me to uh, take the scope and point it west and east and at the center of the target and push off three shots uh, aimed one way and three shots aimed the other way. And sadly, I should have in my head which way was east and which way was west anyway. Went out to the target. And the, now let's see if I can get this right in my head, which way I was aiming. Fortunately, the road goes exactly east-west so that we were out there. Um, that's east. It was coming towards us. But yeah, when I shot east, it was uh, the three bullets were above the center of the target by about three and a half inches uh, on, when we were aimed east and below the target when we were aimed to the west. And I shot at the center of that target both, like, all three times, and it was locked at the target, so there was no movement in my hand. And, yeah. and I said to him, why is that? And then he said, and he described, he said, as the target is moving towards you, once you fire that bullet, it's coming towards you because it's coming towards you, the target rises up, blah, 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 and the other target was going away, so the bullet drops down and hits. And I said to him, do you have to adjust for that in your shooting? And he said, if I'm shooting beyond 1,000 yards, it depends which direction that I am aiming, and yes, I do. And this guy can hit target centers, and he showed me with that little maneuver, there is a difference. And so I don't like, and anybody can do this. You just, especially down in the U.S., because you guys have way more guns than we do, um, you can go and set this up. And this is uh, something I got to see with my own eyes. Yeah. Again, you know, if if you talk to your friend again, get a ballistics chart because one, it shouldn't be that heavy, not at a thousand yards, because uh, a thousand yards isn't even isn't even three quarters of a mile. Mm-hmm. So it well, should yeah, not it should not be that heavy if that is the case at yeah. a thousand, at a thousand yards. Yeah, there's, but, well, if there's no movement of the earth, the earth and there was no wind, it's a cold winter's day. Uh, those babies should have hit the center of the target every single time because he had the sights adjusted for the center of that target at that distance. Hmm. That, and I was, like, I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty kind of cool. That is kind of cool. Although, you know, again, so, you know, have him, if, if you can talk to him, have him send me any rough calculations he has for what he thinks. I will compare it to anything that I have. But I have yet to hear anybody. Because oh, the guy you just mentioned here, he's the first guy that, that, yeah, that even... Ken's, Ken said three to four inches for a thousand yards. If you're shooting west or east, you're going to drop or you're going to come up. That's all he said to me. He was right. I was. I guess he's done it before. I don't know. The guy can shoot a, a good distance. I mean, he's like a military sniper kind of distance. This guy can do. Sure. Uh, it was, sure. It, I, it just it just seems a little a little much for what he's doing, especially since you're basically saying at at low altitude that mm-hmm. you know that you're that you're taking into account, even though planes don't account for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, planes are a slow version. Well, depending on how fast the plane is. And I know yeah, he's shooting, I, I know he's shooting a high caliber weapon. So he's probably doing 1800 feet per second, 2000 feet per second, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so he, said like, that, he said, you also have to calculate for the spin of the bullet coming out the barrel 
and then uh, the wind, if there is any wind, and then a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'm like, geez, how the hell do you make a shot like that sitting? And he goes, practice. He said, but if you know that it's going to pull to the right or to the left because of the spin of the barrel, and you know that you are going to drop three inches this way or you're going to rise up three inches this way, Ken's very um, vehement about being able to hit the target because the last thing he wants is for an animal to suffer when he hunts. Oh, sure, sure, sure. And um, so, and again, he's probably a hell of a shot. I'm just questioning if he's actually thinking, again, because the, the rise that you're talking about there, it's, oh, man, it's an awful lot for, for a thousand yards because I shoot. Mm-hmm. And there's... Well, you I should do, be able to do it then. You should be able to go out and do the same thing. And then, and if it doesn't happen, then you'll know it's, it was a freak accident. Yeah, I'd have to find a good place to do it, though, because we're talking, you know, some decent distances. I'm oh, not... You're, I'm not, you're, you're I'm probably not, by a city. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I'm, I'm, we're from Canada, you know, and I'm thinking, you can shoot anywhere and not hit anything. I, I, I make it sound like we're... No, it's not that bad up here. But we're, no, no, no it, it's good. It's just that I've, I've, I've talked to too many people now that have said the exact opposite, which have said, look, especially the, the, the sniper instructor. But mm-hmm. that's, in fact, the sniper instructor, that's the low distances. I concentrate on the stuff that's 20 miles and further, which they say, because, you know, at 20 miles, you should be doing a heck of a lot of adjusting mm-hmm. for the spin of the earth. And they're all, they all say the same thing. The, the sniper instructor, and that was just a couple months ago that I got the email from him, and he's, he's going, no. He goes, it's not in the manual. And if it's military and it counts, if it's going to affect your shot, they're going to put it in there. Yeah, and, it's you know, really weird because if you go online, and I, I did that after Ken's thing, um, and you look it up, you can find lots of videos where the people uh, explain how to um, adjust for the, sorry, what's it called? Coriolis. Coriolis effect, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah well, actually, it's online not, I was curious not a lot of videos. There, there are a there, there are a few videos out there that, where they talk about it, but I still don't find the, uh, the charts and what they're talking about to match up. Mm-hmm. Well, as I said, if you, if you can, take your own gun, because, and I would tell this to everybody out there too, don't trust, we, we have no idea who out there is uh, working for the bad guys or working for the good guys. I mean, for all you guys know, I could be one of the bad guys. No, I doubt it. No, I could be. I, and right. that's the point. I could be. I could be out here to be coming and telling everybody, you know, uh, and, and I could. Nobody knows for a fact that I'm not. And so what I tell people is when you hear somebody talk about whatever theory, do what you can to go out and check for yourself. When people come to our website, I say, don't take our word for what we found. Take the system, and if it cannot work, you need to prove that, and then you need to take this down. Um, and it should work with everything that we hear on the web is don't trust anyone because the system set up on this world is designed to um, get people fighting against each other, black people against white people, fear, you know, just get people religion and everything that they can so that they're not focusing on what really matters in this world. Yeah. Okay. By the way, you're not, you're not helping your case much by saying that you don't... <laughs> That you could be a bad guy because hey, it's- I don't want people to trust what I say. I want them to get their butts out there and take a camera and go take a picture of the moon. Go take a picture of the sun. Uh, check this. Check that. And and do that against every single thing because if if I'm wrong, they need to find that out for themselves. But they can't just take our word for it because then they're no better off because they haven't learned to think. They've only learned to go oh. I got baffled by BS, and so I'll follow it because it was so confusing that I have no idea if it was right or not, but it was so confusing it must be right because I didn't understand it. And then I see that happen in churches all the time when people do stuff in the pulpits, and I'm like, are you kidding me? That made no sense. Yeah. And yet people, people follow blindly because <laughs> what, what, who said that? If you can't dazzle them with your brilliance, oh, I know, WC4. Yeah, 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 I, I know what you're saying. You know, baffling with the BS, and there's so much BS out there, especially on the net right now. It is, it's really bad, and people need to actually look at that. Hey, what I've, which, sorry, no, I was it's okay. say, Hollow Earth, Hollow Earth. Yeah. Are the Hollow Earth people right? Um, the Hollow Earth actually doesn't conflict with this, believe it yeah, or that's not. What, that's what I mean. But the Hollow Earth people say that there's a sun inside and that it's round inside. The pure, yeah. 
yeah, if you're if you're a purist in Hollow Earth, they uh, they they go down that road of yeah, you know, there's a, another sun inside, which you know, why not, right? You know, that'd be cool. That would be cool. Cool is if is if there was uh, this whole thing and there was multiple. Hey, have you ever seen is a really bad old Canadian uh, TV show called Star Lost? It was done back in the seventies, and what it was is this cataclysm that occurred on Earth. And so they built this huge, and I'm talking 300, 400-mile spaceship with domes along the sides of it, and each culture was in specific domes. And then something went wrong, and the uh, bridge crew were killed, and this uh, spaceship uh, started approaching the planet it was supposed to go to, but because nobody was on board, it was heading to the sun. And then this guy in a farm community... Uh, finds out that it, the world is hollow and I've touched the sky and they get out into the main area. It was a very cool concept. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if I wonder if we're on one of those ships. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Oh, actually, by the, by the way, no, no, no offense. You know, the, the Hunter story, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. What I am waiting for, though, more than anything, is to it, any, any one person. You know, I've, I've had, you know, a bunch of military people now in, in uh, different disciplines that have come to me, and I've been waiting for someone to counter it from the military side. You know, somebody from the United States Navy saying, oh, yeah, this guy that's talking about the Sparrow missile system, he's completely off his rocker. It's not how it works. Or, this, or the submarine or the artillery guy, or even a sniper. You know, I would, and, and these things are getting a lot of hits, and, uh, you know, no one's coming forward to challenge it. In fact, I get, well, I, in fact, I, the, there the is opposite. one possibility. There is one possibility. What? And that is, that a Joe Blow sniper who does this yeah. uh, says to himself, are you serious? And then he shuts it off. And uh, the guys that are coming forward, um, maybe they're not really snipers. I don't know. Maybe they're actually the powers that be are sending these guys in order to feed you information that's not real. See, I don't trust anybody. I'm paranoid. Nice, nice. Well, yeah, except I've, I've vetted several of them, and, and they're okay. all... They're all groovy. Well, gentlemen, well, gentlemen uh, I would like uh, to interject here right now. Um, I would like you, you guys have, well, it's not like you're having a great time. Uh, it has been a very interesting uh, conversation. It's thought provoking in several ways. Um, what I'd like to do now is that if you would be willing to uh, think about it for a little bit, say your closing remarks of where you stand on things. Um, I, I know that this is a very complicated issue, and I, I'm recognizing that there's so many facets to uh, dealing with here as far as having an understanding whether the Earth is flat or round, et cetera, at this point. It's caused us all to think quite a bit, but uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, while you're thinking about your closing thoughts here, uh, he left us already said he couldn't handle it anymore. <laughs> it would be Zen Garcia. But he left, yeah. he left uh, a couple comments. comments. Um, I guess mine had quite a few comments. I don't know if anybody... Uh, you, you realize uh, the uh, what, 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 this show, because we, we haven't even touched on, like, uh, there's probably 200 things we haven't even touched on. Oh, no, that's was problem with this issue. So and it's how to yeah. do it, especially... For those who, you know, are not convinced that the Earth is flat, there's many things to ask. So. But he says uh, here, Zen goes, uh, science also says the moon moves in synchronous rotation with the orbit of the Earth right. when it actually spins clockwise above the Earth, in, uh, contrary to. And it has been scientifically proven that the Earth does not move, and if it's not moving, then... This is completely. This completely destroys the whole argument of, uh, that the Earth is spinning daily on an axis and orbiting the Sun. He posted. I said that gentleman to you. Uh, um, notable heliocentrist experiments that failed to detect any movements of the Earth around the Sun, and of course we're talking about the Michelson-Morley experiments and the Michelson. Gale experiment and etc. And uh, there you that, go. that went right over my head. I just thought I'd mention that. Yeah, well, I think that's uh, something that uh, needs to be dealt with here because there's been there the experimentation that's been done that's proved contrary to a lot of things that 
as far as that the earth is a ball and it's rotating and all that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. these are things they should have been, you know, a lot of things that could have been, uh, maybe could have been addressed and talked about. But I think, you know, there's so many other aspects to the um, and the curiosities that people have about this uh, flat earth uh, bottle. Yeah. Yeah. You can do so, 10 hours on this and not, not touch everything. No, you can't. It's just too much. And a lot of it, uh, it comes down to is uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions. So, mm-hmm. But anyways, before we, uh, we, um, I don't know if anybody's going to be asking questions. I'll say, I could probably read a few of their statements after this. But I would like to have, base, well, at this point, where your stances are individually, uh, your positions, even though I think I clearly, well, I believe I Mark's stance. I think it's not going to be much of a change, but still, let's hear it anyways. Okay. <laughs> so um, let's hope not. If it was that easy, that'd be like that'd be disappointing. No, no I, I don't. I don't think uh, it, it, this is one of those things about these debates. I had many times, well, you know, we try to sway the our opponents to our side, and it does not do that. What it does, though, is uh, drive more questions and it's a very important thing in all this is to drive more questions and get us to think and uh, outside our, our normal thinking and uh, I think it, one thing from my observations from you know I've been a, a steady follower of Mark's work so I, these are kind of questions that I haven't heard anybody ask Mark some of the things that you asked so I think it was good and that was res- respect so that's my yeah, opinion like for whatever about, it's worth. So, what I like about what happened tonight is uh, that it wasn't like Mark and I going at each other. It was more like a, let's look at these items and see if we can come up with an answer as to why they are existing. Well, I think that's what's going to have to be done here, right? And I, I thought think. that was really cool. Yeah, and that's, I think, uh, because people need to stop being religiously fervored about uh, any concept in their life. Uh, like, you can't sit here and get angry and say, oh, I can't believe you can't see that. But you need to sit down and say, okay, He's brought up a good point. Well, let's go and look for an answer to that. Uh, and because when you when you get emotional about it, emotions are a wonderful servant, but they are a lousy master. And when we are looking at things in a scientific viewpoint, the emotions have to be put aside because the only thing that counts is truth. Yeah. Well. Well, you know, it's interesting here. Uh, well, let's, well, before we go any further, let's just hear your, your two pos- positions at this point. Um, uh, uh, and even if it's redundant, let's do this. <laughs> it's okay, uh, we'll, stand, we'll, we'll start with Mark this time with okay. his position where he stands at this point uh, sure. as far as his, uh, the flat earth model and uh, how he sees it. Okay. Uh, when it comes to, uh, I'll try to boil it down as best I can. When it comes to the flat earth model, I'd like to make a quick modification, and that is we are still, the movement is still trying to work out the details of exactly what the shape of the world is. What we do know for sure, which is why you see dissension in the ranks, which is why you see factions and different camps and and all sorts of different opinions. I try to say it kind of like, if anyone remembers the the movie, the Monty Python movie, Life of Brian, uh, because it's so fitting, where Brian, you know, is, is like, uh, he's a version of Jesus Christ. He's mistakenly uh, recognized as the Messiah, and he's running around, and there's people following him, and they're really fanatical. Brian represents the flat earth, and at some point, Brian drops his shoe while he's trying to run from all, his, all these enthusiastic people. And everyone stops around the shoe, and they try to find the meaning in it. Mm. And some people are saying, Oh, we should we should hold up the shoe and put it on a pedestal and declare it to be holy. No, no, no. We should collect shoes, you know. And, and a third guy goes, No, no. We should all wear just one shoe like him. And then the woman in the back goes, No, it's the gourd. The gourd. We have to follow the gourd. She's like the the minor faction. But the point was, is it really summed up what's happening with what, us right now, and and that we are all are trying to figure out exactly what this is. What we do know for sure, what we all can agree on, is that the world that you know, the world that you are living in right now, it is not as advertised. There is something going on there, and it has been hidden from you for at least the last 60 years. Uh, the powers that be at the highest level know exactly what this place is, and they have kept it under lock and key for a long time, and either deliberately or inadvertently, it is being revealed now. 
uh, in stages. And I do not know why. There is another part to this, this, this play. There is an Act 3. I am still trying to figure it out, and uh, I, I, you know, the, the flat earth is just a part of it, but it is a big part. So, you know, enjoy the ride because it's going to be a heck of a 2016. Yeah, I think so. Uh, um, yeah, Chris, you're next. So. I keep thinking stock market crash every time he says that. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I'm worried about that coming. Um, the reason that I'm uh, still staying with this fear, if, like anyone was surprised, is because um, when I look at certain things in the sky, and I wish we had time to get in things like retrograde motion where the planets move and move backwards, if I sit down and I create a model on my table and I uh, make the planets go around and everything as they should, I can explain a lot of stuff. And the sphere, the sphere model of the universe and everything spinning is so incredibly simplistic and, com- and completely functional uh, that be- because of who I am, I'm very much an Occam's razor, and that is uh, whatever takes the least amount of assumptions is most likely the correct answer. And when I look at the sphere model and, and the function of it, it is, it is so simple and answers so many of the questions. This is why I, I still reside with the sphere model. Okay. Okay. And, and let me, can, can, I, can I throw in one more little, or, or did you want to do questions or? Uh, oh, we will uh, after, uh, we'll, we will in a bit here. So. Well, no, no, let's, let's do that. Just remind me beforehand because it's a bit of a news thing I want to read uh, before, we, before we close the show. Okay, cool. You, uh, well, do you, want me, do you want me to read it now? Yes, do that now. So okay. Um, just see so the, the, the traction that this thing is picking up. Uh, and I'm waiting for the second level. I, I think I kind of joked with people. I said this: you'll know when this thing hits the second level because you'll get B and C, B and C list celebrities of whatever walks of life. They're going to start talking about this thing, either pro or against. And as of 40 minutes ago, New York Magazine talks about a celebrity: Tila Tequila, uh, new belief system, insists the Earth is flat. And declare she's immortal. And this. Oh yeah, she had to declare she was immortal, didn't she? Well, yeah, yeah, because yeah. that was yeah, exactly. You have to you have to lump the two in yeah. together. But hey, as long as Ryan Reynolds is not going with this, I'm okay. Because <laughs> Ryan Reynolds is Canadian, nice. Well, or or Nathan Fillion also. I, okay. There you go. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but it was just something that I, you know. I look for these, uh, you know, the, the news stories out every day, and this one's starting to get traction. It's already getting picked up by six different outlets, and uh, it's, it's only going to help because people are going to look into this regardless of if they hate it or not. It's, it's, yeah. Again, you, you, this story should not be out there, and it's out there because somebody's allowing it to be out there. Mm-hmm. If the AP is running this, that means the AP is being allowed to run it, and that's what I'm trying to figure out why. So anyway, well, sorry, just carry on. You, which is why you won't see any stories on the Chronicle Project. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, man. All right, well, I'll read some of our uh, guest nine. He seems to be the one the most, well, he is the most active as far as comments. Okay. Uh, I was hoping Zen would stay on so he could meet Mark. I think that they would have an interesting show. I definitely oh. think you should reach out to Zen, and maybe I'll send you some contact information that you guys have sure. a good show. Uh, it says here, uh, guest nine, what is the furthest land survey conducted that proves no curvature. Do you know? Does anybody know? Uh, That's right. You mean the, the, the longest continuous flat land survey, as far yes. as we know? Uh, the visual, the longest visual one I heard was out of the Hawaiian Islands. There was an island that was like 120 miles uh, from, from shoreline to shoreline, and that they could see it. And there, yeah, it's, it's Kauai visible from uh, the uh, island of Hawaii. And on certain days, you can see the whole island. It's uh, 70 miles away. I've seen a couple okay. of pictures. Okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's out in the Hawaiian Islands somewhere. Um, although, it's you'd have to take your pick on. Um, I mean, there's others around the world, but I think that's got to be towards the longest. Mm-hmm. Hold right. on. Wait a second. I know. I know the longer one because Brad talked about it. Uh, he was sitting on the shores of an island and he was talking with this lady and they saw lights in the distance and he said what is that and she said it's cuba and i think he said it was 110 miles wow over the ocean well let's see if i could we're going to add 
uh, Brad to the, this discussion, and he can talk about that experience for us. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite an impressive little story. Um, the next one is, uh, question is, does light bend up or down, or does it bend at all? Mm-hmm. That's a good one. one. Is, does light bend up or down, or does it bend hey, at all? Hey, Brad, Brad, turn off, your, uh, turn off the radio. I assume, Brad, I Brad assume. turn off the radio. You stay on. You can stay on. You stay on a Skype. Just turn off the radio. Because you're getting an echo. Um, I assume he's saying, "Does it bend in the atmosphere?" Is what he's. That's asking. what. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he means. Okay. The answer is it depends on the temperature of the atmosphere. Number one, it depends on how close the observer is to the uh, ground or not ground because the density of the atmosphere gets thicker. The denser the atmosphere, the more curved. On average, in a dense atmosphere, it curves down. And uh, you can have other little tricks there because if you've got warm under cold and stuff like that, you can get inversions. There's a whole bunch of crap that goes with it. It's kind of cool. But is it? Is he asking the question because he's wondering if uh, the like the Chicago Mirage is what they, is actually a mirage? And oh, that, I sent it, some pictures. I sent some pictures of that to um, to Michael. Yeah. Can you stick those anywhere where people can see those, Michael? Um, I can't figure it out. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, can you? How about you? Can you send well, those? What I was going to say to people is I, I put together a, a grouping of them and sent them to Michael because Michael had mentioned to me that from where he is on the side of the lake, he can see Chicago. Christopher, so what he did is a, Christopher. Before we get any further, uh, you should be able to. Sure. You should be able on your end to actually send them in to or. Uh, put them in Skype for us if you want. It. Except it'll, it'll be too small. What, what I'll tell people to do is, where where did you stand in order to see Chicago? There's a, a land area, sort of like a park or something, where everybody shoots these from? For me? Yes. Well, I've seen it from uh, uh, the Indiana Sand Dunes and Michigan. That's what it is. And Michigan, what it is. Michigan City, Indiana. So tell me I've about... Not, I've not witnessed the uh, Chicago skyline from St. Joseph. Okay. Never. The one that you mentioned... Uh, what people do is if they type that in, you'll get tons of images because everybody's taking pictures of this. What's very interesting to look at is if, if the earth was flat and you were looking straight at uh, Chicago, then the images should always be the same. But if you look at the images I sent you, sometimes you only get the tips of the skyscrapers, sometimes you get a whole lot of the skyscrapers, sometimes you get in between. The uh, image itself is varying. And because the image is varying, you have to ask yourself, why is the image not constant if I'm just looking over flat Earth? Refraction. Okay. Refraction, exactly. Refraction will bend light, and so you'll actually be able to see around the curve because light bends as you go around. And the, the closer you are down, the more it bends, like the closer you are to the ground. Hmm. So you can see, literally... Uh, sometimes 100 miles, especially over the ocean, because the ocean will remain warm at night, and, but the air gets cold, and then you get some real nice bending. What, you want me to respond to that? Oh, I, I don't care. It's just that I'm okay. just No, no, I got, I've, I've, heard, I've heard the argument both ways, because people, yeah. unfortunately, will use refraction both for and against flat earth. They'll say exactly. that refraction, refraction is causing the, the, the image to make it over the water, and other people are saying, well, uh, refraction is actually what's, what's allowing... What's you know, allowing it not to be seen. Okay, that's good. Uh, um, yeah, so... We well, have, this, uh, this, uh, just to let you know, uh, Guest 9 says uh, you guys have not... He says that is not a land survey. Mm-hmm. Land survey. We, so... Are we referring to the... Uh, oh, I guess, yeah, an actual call, government one kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's what oh, you mean like yeah. like we went down to that that massive salt flat down in South America and went from like one end of the sixty miles to the other end of the sixty miles and actually tried to shoot a laser or somebody turn on their headlights and see if we could see it type of thing. I I don't know. Yeah, I, I would assume that's what he's getting at. So yeah, I mean, but, the, but for I'll, I'll use the example. You know, the um, if he if he hadn't already heard my guy, have him listen to the. Uh, that career surveyor that I had on. He worked 32 years in the industry and shot massive tracts of land um, all the way up to 25, 30 miles. Now, you don't shoot 25 and 30 miles in one shot. You're shooting at like 500 yards a crack. 
you know, with lasers. But he's saying that the curvature was never, ever taken into account, nor South, East, West butting up against any other projects, nor was it ever discussed during any, anything with any other surveyors. So he goes, even by accident, that should happen. And he goes, it's not. He goes, in fact, when they teach people how to be surveyors, they teach them, they all say the same thing. They go, treat the world like it's perfectly flat. And I thought that was very, and he didn't, and he, of course, you know, he didn't get it. He didn't get it until he listened to, you know, started listening to this stuff. And he's going, holy smokes. That's why I missed it. Okay. Um, Well, we'll we'll stay on topic before going to the next question. Uh, Brad, uh, if you will, uh, you can introduce yourself to to Mark. You already know Chris and myself uh, because you're a co-author of the book. uh, The, the, uh, oh, gosh, gentlemen, what's the name of your book again? The the Destruction of Sabbath, the history uh, behind it. If you want a free copy of it, go to our website, thechronicleproject.org. Right there on the homepage, you'll see the book. Click on the book itself, and there's a free copy for you. It was a bestseller on Amazon, so have fun. Well, of course, I knew the name of that, but of course, I have another mental It's a a stupid long name, so it... No, it's it's, it's actually very easy to remember. But, Brad, if you're still there, maybe you could share the experience that you had. Uh, Mark, as you know, Brad is another... Flathead. So, <laughs> although it's just, a, it looks like there's still a round here. mustache. The, uh, at least uh, <laughs> guest nine is uh, is definitely uh, similar to, um, if not uh, a globalist, he's certainly. Um, uh, oh my God! Has, we've got a globalist Ask Asking some very very poignant questions, so I'm glad he joined. Yeah. But anyways, Brad, a- Brad, if you want to. Uh, Tell us a little bit about your experience that you had. Um, yeah, uh, Mark, nice to meet you. Good to chat hey. with you. And uh, uh, fan of fan of your work and uh, um, enjoyed watching your videos and, and uh, following your uh, studying and stuff. Um, it's been fascinating listening to you and Chris. You guys are um, both uh, excited uh ideas and thoughts that have made me think in different areas that I haven't thought before. So uh, good job tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple things uh, to answer uh, Michael's question. Um, I did have an interesting experience. I was down, I'm uh, for a while was heavily into scuba diving and uh, was down in Cozumel and uh, uh, one evening, they, oh, there was this young lady that I met down in Cozumel, a Mexican uh, girl down there. And we were out after dinner sitting on this dock um, uh, off of Cozumel and out in the ocean saw these lights twinkling out there. And I asked her what they were and she goes off just no, not, didn't even bat an eye at all on it and said that uh, those were the lights of Cuba. And so I just recently remembered that experience and I'm like, ah, I wonder how far away that was. And so I went on Google Earth and Google Earth will have you know or have you think that from uh, the closest to Cuba point from Cozumel to the closest point of Cuba is uh, 110, 120 miles. Um, oh, I got it right. But uh, you get into more like the population area, it's more 150, 160 miles mm-hmm. uh, from where I was to uh, the population area. So I, I would suspect that I was probably looking at somewhere around 140, conservatively 140, 160 miles. Um, wow. So you know, I would love to go back down there again and take a look at that and really see what, what I was experiencing at that time because that was before, to me, I never even questioned and it was just like, oh, that's Cuba. Wow, it's really close. That's cool. I'm close to Cuba <laughs> and never really thought much about it. Wow. So, Amazing. Uh, so there, there's a lot of, uh, the, for, what are the dilemmas we're at right now, of course, is... Uh, Flat Earthers is this new political movement. It's only, uh, what, a year, year and a half old, going against 500 years of supposed 
science. So we're gonna, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of it's anecdotal. It's just what we just heard. So just like my own experience, but those personal experiences are the reason why we're listening to people like Mark uh, more than probably the science itself. Uh, and the next one question to be is uh, Samuel uh, Burley. I guess he pronounced his name. Uh, Roth. How do you pronounce his name again? Robotham the uh, equation of the curvature, is it only a theory or truth? Is the, is the curvature math theory or is it? Well, I mean, well, it's, 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 eight, it's, it's eight inches per mile squared. So if you're, you know, if, if we, what we're told is a sphere is a sphere, then yeah, it's true. But we, you know, the flatter side hasn't been able to find it yet. Right, and I think there's a valid point what he's saying there with that uh, Rothbottom. Is that how you pronounce his name? Roth, Rothbottom. Rothbottom. Right. Rothbottom. Yeah. There you go. There has to be an intelligent person in this group. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Brad. Yeah. Well, you know, it is a, a, a good question to ask because um, uh, one of the bases that we have and why we say that the Earth is flat is because of this. This the math doesn't work. <laughs> coming yeah. from this equation. So is this equation actually accurate or not? Has anybody tried to prove the, the, the accuracy of the equation? I believe there's a gentleman in Australia that has actually done that, but I'm not quite sure who, uh, I can't remember who that well, is. Well, the equation, and I've got, I've got the, the whole chart up in front of me right now. The, um, the equation looks accurate because you have to, if, if you believe what they tell you. So if the Earth is just a hair under 8,000 miles wide, meaning radius, not, not, not if you circle it with a, with a, you know, over around the equator, which is 25,000 miles. But if it's 8,000 miles wide, that means it drops off to the infinite at just about half of that, which is 3,959 miles. And if you just keep backing that up, uh, eventually, yeah, you get to 8 inches per mile squared. Uh, so, look, I mean, again, if, if the Earth is 8,000 miles thick and it's a perfect sphere, then, yeah, that's what the math works out to. And, yeah, the, ma- you know. the math would work because if you're standing on the north pole of the sphere and you draw a line straight out from there, uh, it's, uh, when, when that line gets about 3,000 miles out, there is no more globe as it circles around. That would be the perimeter, so you'd be at the 90-degree mark, and, of course, it would drop to the infinite because there's wouldn't be any more land mass underneath that. Yeah. Now, that being said, I'd like to add one more thing, because lots of flat earthers will say, uh, because we can't see the curve, you know, there's no picture of the curve from the Earth from, uh, you know, 100,000 feet, 120,000 feet, whatever it is, that it, that it proves flat Earth. And there's been some 3D models done use, using this as a, as a guide, which basically shows that actually you wouldn't even, if it was a, a sphere, you wouldn't see the curve until you got up hundreds of miles. Yeah, any yeah, indication exactly. of the which means that no, the, the the weather balloon footage doesn't prove a flat Earth, but the highly exaggerated fisheye stuff that NASA shows, at the very least, shows that NASA is being deceptive. No, well, there's. There, I, I, hey, I, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold Hey, uh, Zen, are you there? Zen, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Zen, Zen Garcia is on. Uh, yeah. Zen, I'd like you to meet Mark Sargent, a uh, fellow flathead. Hey, Zen. I, 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 I just, I, you, 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 it's Chris. There's one, two, three, five, five against us, four against you. <laughs> four to one. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> but you do have, it sounds like you do have guest nine a, a bit on I, side, I've so. been brainwashing. I've been brainwashing Brad, so he's a midi. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, uh, Zen. If you're int- uh, if you're willing to, I know you had a, you had a hard time at the time the discussion was going. She had to leave for a little bit, and I rudely pulled you into here. But I wanted you first to meet Mark because I think you guys are interesting. You guys should have fun together. Cool. Uh, oh yeah, you have great. We, we, me and Mark have done round table before. Oh okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, we, were, we were on a show with Mr. Rowe one time. Right. There you ah. go. Right now, I remember. God, that was a while ago. Okay, we're getting old, yeah, people. Yeah. We're getting but, old. But Zen's Zen's the one that, that sent this uh, article, the biblical uh, biblical scholarship dot net failed uh, uh, HTM, the notable heliocentric experiments that failed to detect any movement of the Earth around the Sun, and he brought up that this was. If this was a brought up during the middle of your conversation, gentlemen, that mm-hmm. might have went a different direction. 
but now we are where we're at, and I would, if you're willing, Zen, to talk a little bit about it. Zen has done a book, folks, his ninth book, uh, about this particular topic and uh, how he connects it with uh, actually the Book of Enoch that uh, makes it even more of a stronger evidence that we most likely live on a plane. So would you be willing to comment yeah, a little I bit? Have to, uh, I have to say that my book is focused on the biblical side of it. I don't rehash all of these scientific experiments and all of the other side of it that has been, you know, covered so very well by so many authors like Samuel Robotham and uh, like the author of Terra Firma. And, and so, and specifically, it applies to the Book of Enoch, the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries, and those 14 chapters, because you can only decrypt um, what Enoch is specifying as the motions of the sun and the moon above the earth, um, if you apply it to the flat earth as model of the world. Other, if you try to figure it out according to the heliocentric model, it doesn't make any kind of sense, which is why um, nobody's understood that portion of the text for the last 500 years. Right. And, and and specifically what I was saying about these three experiments in this particular website is that it has been scientifically proven that the earth does not move. And if it is not moving, then it completely destroys the whole argument that the earth is spinning daily on an axis and orbiting around the sun. There's three scientific experiments which, you know, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, shall the truth be established, and they affirm, just as the Bible does, um, in you know, Psalms 96, Psalms 104, Isaiah 40, Isaiah 45, uh, Psalms 93, 1 Chronicles 16, 30, all these passages reference that the earth is fixed, stationary, and motionless. And th- these scientific experiments also verify the same. And so that completely destroys the whole Darwinian heliocentric worldview. Now, I'm not sure if we should attach Darwin to heliocentric, though, because that's not something Darwin was working on. Yeah, but they're, they work hand-in-hand hand to bring on the strong delusion. So the in my problem, opinion, that's why I attach them together. The problem that I have, and I have to bring this up, Sam, with, um, with using the scriptures as proof that um, that the earth is as it is, uh, a flat and unmoving uh, place in the heavens, is because you get stuff um, like in Psalms 104 where it said, uh, who did establish the earth upon its foundations that it should not be moved forever and ever. And then you jump into Isaiah 13:13. 13, 13, it says, therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth shall be shaken out of her place for the wrath of the Lord of hosts and for the day of his fierce anger. So which one of these scriptures he is wrong because they completely conflict with each other. Well, right. there's five of them that say that it's not moving, and uh, if that's the one that you want to bring forth, then I would say that it does more weight that it's not moving. And then, so as I, I said, so putting I the, the Bible prophet, aside, I'm just the saying, putting the Bible. No, because Isaiah also says in chapter 40, um, I think it's like verse 19 that the earth is fixed and stationary and moving. So, I mean, I don't think he's contradicting himself. Well, it says, and the earth shall be shaken out of her place. That's a contradiction. Well, that's, that may be... If it's translated correctly. Okay. Jenna, can I... uh, I would would like to uh, follow through with a couple more questions here on the chat room, so... And... uh, Wait a second. Before we leave this, though... Let's um, give Chris a chance to um, address these scientific experiments which verify that the Earth is not moving. Actually, I'm glad I mean, you that said, totally trumps I'm glad, the I'm whole glad heliocentric you, worldview. I'm okay. glad you said Very good. Thanks. Thanks. What I would, the Michelson like. scale experiment, Aries failure, the SAGNAC experiment, and there are others, uh, but these are those three that are part of this particular d- uh, web database, and they were done to try to confirm the heliocentric worldview. And yeah. when they failed, they actually confirmed that the Earth was 
stationary. Are there any of these experiments, and this is something that I, I brought up with Brad a lot of times, we're looking at all this stuff on the web, and we're assuming that this stuff is real and it's accurate and it's not something that's been placed there. And what I've been looking for is, are there any of these experiments that we, as a group, or as the people that are out there listening, that we can go out and we ourselves can do so that we can see with our own eyes and know for a fact that this uh, information is accurate? And if we can do this, we should be collecting uh, groups yeah, of Yeah, sure, you can do them. And others have verified and confirmed it and, and re- repeated the experiment. So thank, what we need to do... For- Thank you for bringing that up, um, Chris, and I'd like to jump in here if you don't mind. Um, sure. Your, your uh, discussion earlier with, with Mark about the, uh, the bullet at 1,000 yards, and I asked you, uh, and I explained to you, or I mentioned to you that um, based on the spin of the bullet, um, if you're Pointing one direction, it will spin down. You point the other direction, it'll spin up. Well, no, a bullet, when you're shooting a bullet, the spin causes it to go either left or right, depending on which way you're aiming. It doesn't make it go up or down. Mm, well, not necessarily. No, I don't no that's, that's, that's how it works when you shoot, is the bullet will always pull to the one side like a curling rock. So, oh, sorry, I said a curling rock. I'm Canadian. <laughs> oh, I can't believe I said so, that. So the study, and, and you mentioned that he said that he took that into account. So now <laughs> he's entered in, to, to challenge that, he's entered in human error into that. Well, Here, what he did is when he sets up, his, when he sets up a gun to shoot, right. uh, you, you aim it at the target and you shoot, and then you have to correct the sights, shoot again, correct the sights and shoot again, in order to make it work for the right. side so, to side. So let me let me postulate a possible test that we could do that would be sure. relatively inexpensive. Awesome. If you have a laser scope mm-hmm. and you can put a target out far enough out, say a thousand yards, in one direction, say right. uh, uh, east and one west, and you shoot. Uh, in that laser, a laser scope goes out there, presents a target, a, a, a target on your target of where that bullet is a is a level point of aiming at. Then you should be able to calculate for the spin of the of the bullet, right, and predict mm-hmm. where that bullet's going to hit based on the vo- the velocity and the spin of that bullet, and then you. Rather than taking anything to, into effect, you have it on a tripod. You perfectly spin it around mm-hmm. level yep. into an east direction and do the exact same thing again. Yes, and and see what the what the change is. And you should easily be able to calculate the the spin versus the velocity. And then That's, if there's any variation on that, then you would know that there is some sort of Coriolis effect. Yeah. Actually, because you brought the laser in, Ken actually has a laser mounted on it. That's how he's able to see at 1,000 yards where he is because you can't really trust the, um, the scope's uh, crosshairs. So he uses a laser mount on it. So when that bullet paints on the center of the target, he knows he's right on the target. Right. So what I'm saying is level the, okay. level the barrel, level the mm-hmm. scope, Level everything and don't okay. don't adjust the scope. Okay. Make make a shot to the west and make a shot to the east and, and then, make sure that the gun's level. I think that's a good right. idea that I did not take into account. He's leveling the gun. Um, I think it was, but I I did not observe that in the experiment. So what I'll do is I'll I'll get Ken out and we'll do it again. And we should also make sure that the like we should level the gun and then we should bring the target up to the laser so that we know that both east and west, that target is at that same level both ways. Agreed. That yeah. there, so if you have a, a, a point mm-hmm. that your laser, your laser is level east and west at 1,000 okay. yards, so 2,000 yards between them. It's a good idea. In theory, if your velocity and your load on your, on your shell is the same, then you mm-hmm. should have the same... Uh, change in trajectory um, 
going east and west. And if there's a difference between those two, then you know that there's some sort of spin or some sort of curvature. Yeah. It's a really good idea. I will actually do that. Okay, Jim. Well, that's great. You know, that's one thing I'm getting from all this is the fact that this particular topic is getting us to think. Yeah, exactly. There's questions that we have not been bothering and we've uh, to do. We haven't bothered to ask these kind of questions. We have abandoned this these, these topics to the authorities, to the astrophysics priestcraft uh, of our day and age, instead of uh, challenging them. It's, a th it's amazing that uh, how they have so much control over our society as a whole and how blind we are to follow what they say. One thing I want to bring up here is this, here's a question. Um, uh, I guess nine, once again, <laughs> I guess nine has a lot of statements. Here. What did they talk about besides theory? Uh, where are the proof that there are re repeatable or either side? Is he, he is talking about movies, powers, that be, why can't we just talk about proofs, repeatable, observable results? Yeah, that's something I, I would like to, this is, I, I mentioned before when we were talking at another time, is that as a group, we need to find every provable uh, experiment that we can, we can do and do them and actually, rather than reading about it on the web, actually do them ourselves. We can do and do for some reason, there's an echo there. Uh, yeah, listen, and by the way, as a group, uh, I, I, as people, and whether it's what side mm -hmm. you're on, and this is regardless if you believe the Earth is flat or round, this yeah. is a this is a combination on all on both sides. The problem is the combination is much more heavier on the the globe the globalist side because they've had 500 years to prove their theory, and we'll still operate on theory. And I think that's for real. Yeah, but in 500 years. They've still not proven that the Earth moves, and it's been proven the other way many, many times. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, in your veil of what you're saying there, Zen, I'm just saying that we, the, 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 domin, the domineering uh, theory that governs our lives and our thinking, whether we, you know, even in, let's face it, even those of us who just come to the flat Earth, it's, I still see the Earth in my head as a ball. So it's going to take a long time to even get that out of my head. <laughs> and so, but the thing is, is what's fascinating is the fact that uh, so many of the aspects of our lives are just, we, we allow theory, guess, mm -hmm. guesses, exactly. the government. And other lives. people to do the work. We let other people do the work. Yeah, this is quite tragic, so. Uh, Mark, do you have a comment about that? Are you still around with us? Have you given up? I, I am, I am <laughs> but, not, but not for much longer, unfortunately. I've, I've got maybe 10 minutes tops, and then I, I got a bolt. Okay. Well, what you so, oh, but anyway, to the comment, uh, yes, there's so many, again, this, this particular topic is not only is it the most uh, polarizing thing ever, but there's so many subtle aspects to it all over the place that – yeah, yeah, people are going to be chewing on, again, which is why it's kind of like a gold rush right now. Everybody's trying to find on both sides. One side is trying to find something that will squash it entirely, uh, which they haven't done in a year, and the other side is trying to find something so easy to understand for the masses that they could say, oh, yeah, by the way, here's why we think it's flat, and then, you know, if it resonates so unbelievably heavily that, you know, then all of a sudden, all of a sudden it becomes mainstream. So, yeah, I mean, I'm looking for some experiments, some repeatable stuff, but right now I'm focused on the uh, on the uh, the people that that have access to things that I don't. I mean, I've got a tank commander I'm going to talk to tomorrow from uh, of the army that says, "Oh yeah, we do a lot of high, you know, long long end shooting, with, and we use a gyroscope on top of the lasers that we use for the artillery side." And uh, so, anyway, sorry, that's my little rant. Hey, hey Mark, this is yeah. this is Brad here. Hey. Um, uh, quick question. I've heard some people talk about, and I don't know if you brought this up in one of your flat earth clues or some interview, but I've heard this discussion and I don't hear it brought up very often, but I'd like to hear you comment on it. And, and that's the idea that they, they quote unquote are hiding earth from us. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, if you don't mind, could you expand upon that a little bit more and, 
Well, yeah, yeah. Again, it's if you were, if you been preaching a perfect spherical, spherical earth for 500 years, you know, granted, you know, the, the, the education system of the world really wasn't getting its legs until about, you know, 150 years ago. Right. But once you started doing that, if you had an inkling that it was wrong, could you hide the whole earth? Could you hide the shape of it, regardless of what it was? Let's say it was, the thing was, it's got to be something radically different. Because if it was like a severe oblate spheroid, I'm stealing from Neil deGrasse Tyson there, or it was blob <laughs> shaped, like, like, a, like, a chew, like a wadded up chewing gum thing or something like that, you could pass that by the people. You could get that past them. It's like, well, it's still sort of round. It's like a squashed basketball, something like that. Whatever it is, it is not anywhere close to the pitcher's. And right. so, yeah, yeah. Uh, are they hiding Earth? Yeah, the, absolutely they are hiding Earth. Uh, but what, you know, what exactly this Earth looks like in reality, uh, that's, it's still up for debate. Uh, because unfortunately, and again, I'm going to steal the Matrix reference here, is uh, they are guarding all the doors, they are holding all the keys. Do you, uh, th- they- Do you think it's possible that they're, and this is something that I've been, has been a mental exercise for myself, if you don't mind indulging me for a second here. No, no, uh, sure. Uh, they've changed the international date line from the Paris Meridian to this 